Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. My name is Kartik, one of the co-founder of ETH Global, and I want to welcome all of you to DAO Hacks. So you're all watching this thing on ETHGlobal.tv. This is what we're going to use today for uh, the opening ceremonies, our, our summit, as well as the finale on Sunday to kind of showcase all the amazing projects. And for those of you joining us for the first time, I really encourage all of you to log in and say hi to us. This is how you can ask any questions to our speakers today. Uh, you can engage with everybody else that's participating at this event. And for everybody that logs in and engages with us, we'll also be giving this NFT PO app. So without further ado, let's get started. So this event is brought to you by ETH Global, and ETH Global is an organization with a very simple mission. Our goal is to onboard thousands of developers into the Web3 ecosystem. And we do this by running hackathons and summit. And DAO Hacks is no different. So for the hackathon, which is what we're gonna kick off today, we have over 475 hackers from 62 different countries participating from 16 varying time zones. This is gonna be an incredible uh, next 48 hours. We can't wait to see what everybody builds and we really hope that uh, all of you figure out how to make this work with all of your time zones because we're excited to see this uh, as a sparking Discord community for 24 seven for the next two days. And we also kind of planned out and mapped out where everybody was coming in from. So it's amazing to see representation from all five, like well, six different continents. And uh, we can't uh, wait to say hi and then meet all of you on our Discord too. So, and in addition, we also have 26 amazing ecosystem partners and 47 ecosystem mentors who are going to be here on Discord, helping you uh, understand kind of how you get unblocked from your hack, whether it's needing technical help or understanding how something works under the hood or understanding how some ecosystem or DAO is, uh, or even a protocol is set up. Uh, I wanna quickly uh, point out that we'll also be doing a lot of uh, talks and workshops. Um, some of them already had happened yesterday and some of them are today. And we'll be giving over $50,000 in prizes, uh, the details of which I'll go into uh, very soon. Uh, I want to quickly thank some of our amazing partners here. So a lot of them are offering prizes. A lot of them are kind of offering their time with giving workshops and talks and interviews. So I want to quickly thank Falcon and IPFS for being an amazing partner. I also want to thank Superfluid, The Graph, Rabbit Hole, Unlock Protocol, Skill Wallet, Lens Protocol, Covalent, the Developer DAO, Tally, Links DAO, Friends with Benefits, Llama, Coordinate, Reverie, Common Revy Fund, uh, and uh, Alliance DAO. Oh, uh, sorry, that's the Taoist. <laughs> uh, Orca Protocol, Parcel, Common Revy Fund, Factory DAO, Gearbox, Utopia Labs, ENS, and Leica. So you can talk to all of these amazing uh, partners on our Discord, and uh, they'll also be here on this uh, live stream uh, shortly with uh, some incredible talks. But uh, let's go into the hackathon. So the goal for this is to cover uh, some of the logistics on how the next 48 hours are going to work. Uh, we'll talk about everything that um, needs to happen here, as well as uh, all the things that you need to be mindful of for your submission. So the, so the most common question we've gotten is, what can I actually build at this event? So we mapped out all the incredible uh, themes and topics that you can think about building gear. Uh, and by the way, this is not exclusive. So you are more than welcome to do anything else that you're interested in. But for those of you who are still looking for ideas, uh, the goal here is to really help encourage interesting tooling uh, and support and, and features that help that can help not only just manage DAOs better, but also working with them uh, in a more coordinated as well as uh, efficient way. So there's a lot of opportunity here in making uh, tools and services for creating and administrating different DAOs, uh, helping with the financial and payments part of it, with that's making something easy or more transparent or more uh, streamlined. Uh, there's a lot of creativity that can be done in how do we use memberships and NFTs uh, to enable access at a more wider scale. Uh, there's a lot of stuff around managing and understanding and participating with governance proposals. Uh, of course, uh, all these things are happening on chain. So there's so much you can do with data and analytics and understanding what's happening for a given community. And the second you kind of amplify creation administration, you also get into discovery and curation. So how do we actually understand what's out there? How do we make that easy to understand our onboard people? All that is a massive theme that um, can use a lot of interesting uh, tools and ideas and, and services that we can all build um, and try out as MVPs for the next 48 hours. And of course, the last one is compliance and legal. A lot of the DAOs here do operate and interact with the real world. So being able to understand that and make that process easier is also a very active theme that we'll be curious to see uh, some interesting acts around. So let's quickly talk about <coughs> the weekend itself. So the goal here is for me to cover 
how all these things are going to work. Team formation, how you can get help, all the prizes you can win, all the talks and workshops we're doing, the summit itself, which we'll go, we're, we'll go into about 20 minutes, and the judging and submission process. So <clears throat> the most important thing is where all things are happening. Uh, all things are happening on the ETH Global Discord, which means that all of you who are confirmed as hackers will have access to this Discord channel. Uh, you can see if you have access to it by seeing and noticing a DAO hacks header on your sidebar. And there you'll find all the channels that are relevant for this event. This is where you can meet everybody else that's participating, talk to any partners or mentors and really get all the help uh, that you need. <clears throat> and these are uh, private channels, which means if you are not a confirmed hacker for this event, you will not be able to see them. So please make sure that from your dashboard, you have connected Discord, and this will give you access to everybody participating at this event. Uh, on top of that, there's also calendar invites for all the talks and workshops that are happening. A lot of you have already gone them and attended a lot of them today as well as yesterday. Uh, but the full schedule of everything that's going to happen is also on the website. We really want this thing to be asynchronous. There's going to be definitely elements here that require everybody to be on the call, for example, judging. But a lot of this is going to be asynchronous because we are accommodating so many different time zones and we will make sure that anybody can catch up even if they have other commitments um, at that given time. Where do we find the schedule? All of that is available on dow.ethglobal.com. So you can go to the website, see everything from prizes to the schedule to the next steps around judging as well as uh, talks. So how does the hackathon actually work? Officially, hackathon has begun, which means that you can start hacking on your projects now. Um, you can work with up to five members uh, on your project, which means that if you are uh, working with the team, you can have up to five people, but you can also work um, by yourself. There's no restriction on you having to uh, have a team. You have 48 hours to hack from here, which means, uh, well, 47 hours and 10 minutes from now is when submissions are due. And uh, we'll kind of talk about what that looks like and how do you actually go about submitting your project as well as judging. Uh, and also, if you have any questions about anything I'm going to say, uh, please feel free to ask them on the live stream chat, and I'll be able to relay those questions uh, back here and answer a lot of them in real time. So <clears throat> the most important thing here for this event is that this is a weekend hackathon, which means it starts today and it ends on Sunday. And as part of the rules and criteria for this event, everything that you're going to uh, be submitting must be done from scratch, which means that you should have started your project now and everything you were going to submit and talk about should have been finished from Friday to Sunday. You cannot build from any pre-existing or personal projects. It is okay to use external libraries or SDKs or boilerplates, but you cannot extend a project that you have been working on or continue something you were doing before, even if it was at an equal hackathon. And on top of that, only RSVP hackers are eligible to win, which means that if you are not a confirmed hacker on the team page that you're submitting for and at the point of submission you do not see your team member's name if you win any prizes we will not honor anybody who was not listed on the submission and of course uh, if you have any questions about this you are more than welcome to ping us on discord or email us and reach out to anybody on the global team and we'll be able to clarify and answer your question um asap and of course uh we understand a lot of you are trying to understand what could be possible here. So if you are new to all this thing, uh, fear not, we have a lot of stuff that's going on to help with this. Uh, you can still go to find a team channel and look out for anybody else who's still looking to join a team. But we've done uh, a couple of uh, workshops already for interactive and synchronous team matching, but uh, there's still a lot of people who are interested in finding other team members, whether it's for a specific skill sets or they're still looking for an idea or they have an idea, but they need somebody who has a complimentary uh, background to help them build it. Um, Finite Team Channel is the place to go. And of course, so many of you are from so many different parts of the world and we're super excited to learn more about you. So we really also encourage you to um, hi, say hi and introduce yourself in the Dow Hacks chat channel and, uh, and get to meet everybody else that's participating. And as I mentioned before, it is totally okay to uh, hack on your own. Uh, you don't have to work with a team. So if you already have an idea or if you know what you want to do or if you want to just learn and challenge yourself, <clears throat> please feel free to uh, submit something on your own. On top of that, there is a lot of amazing talks and workshops and just panels that we're hosting today um, and have already done so uh, earlier today as well as yesterday. So um, 
you can still learn about all these things that are happening. And for those of you who are joining us uh, on uh, global.tv that are not actually hacking at the event, you can still watch all this content uh, for free and, and understand what's happening in this world. Uh, on top of that, there's a summit right after this thing. So the summit starts in about 15 minutes. And for the hackers, all the information that I'm going to talk about here, as well as uh, things that you need to know, whether it's about the judging, the submission process, or anything else, all that is also on your info center, which is linked on your dashboard, as well as on the calendar invites. And again, uh, everything that we're doing here is recorded, so you can easily catch up immediately after by heading over to youtube.com slash eatglobal and watch any talk, workshop, or panel as soon as uh, it ends. Okay, so where do you find all this? By heading over to dow.eatglobal.com. You'll be able to click on a talk and understand when it's happening. It's normalized to your own time zone and you can see the full schedule for the next 48 hours there. So <clears throat> the most important thing here I wanna cover is the submission process. So submissions are due at 12 p.m. Eastern on Sunday the 10th. That is in relative time 47 hours and 45 minutes from now. And everything after that is going to be synchronous, which means that to be eligible to win any prize, uh, especially on the main event side, you will have to be on a Zoom call presenting your prize to our judges. So let's go into how judging works. You will have four minutes to demo to all of the judges or our partners. Uh, if you have participated in a previous Eat Global Hackathon, uh, you may re remember that previous events require a video submission, but for this one, um, it is not required, but we highly recommend that you still record a four minute video of your demo. This way you get to make sure there are no technical difficulties live. And if something goes wrong, we will move on to the next team at the four minute mark. So you will be cut off if things take more time than needed. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second, which is you will have four minutes to demo. You can come and demo anything live. So you can quickly screen share and talk about everything you did. You will be timed uh, for this range. And if you are going to the live demo, of course, you have the same four minutes to talk about and demo and show anything you'd like, but we really prefer that you record a video. This way, the same video can be used for all of the prizes that you're eligible for and people can ask questions. And also you can uh, do things like speed up a mainnet transaction if you are doing, for example, a mainnet transaction that requires much longer uh, to confirm and sort of chop that piece and still be in the time limit for your four minute demo. We know it's going to be a, uh, very tricky to do all these things uh, just as the submission deadline ends. So we really <clears throat> encourage all of you to not do this thing last minute. If you're recording a video, please leave at least one hour to make this work. Uh, and at the same time, really make sure that you're able to uh, spend all this time writing uh, all the description for your submission process and you don't get behind on the submission deadline. All these details are going to be on your dashboard and we're gonna communicate them a lot today and tomorrow. So don't worry if you miss something here, uh, we will be giving a lot of uh, notices and just clarifying a lot of things here. In terms of how uh, judging for prizes goes, you'll have to specify which prize you are going to be eligible for in the submission form itself. So when you are about to submit your project, you'll see a drop down that lets you say, this is the prize I, am want, I want to qualify for. And the second you put anything there, that's when we'll know that we have to notify the given protocol about your submission. So if you forget to do this thing, there's no way for us to know that you wanted to be eligible for this prize. So please make sure that you select all the prizes you're going for. Uh, and you can present all these to the sponsors on the Discord. So we will be coordinating a lot of that live as well. So there's gonna be a main judging and a sponsor judging parallel track and you can join a call on Discord and screen share if you uh, are ready to present there. Uh, and just as a big notice, sponsors will review based on the submission. So we will be sending a link to your showcase to all of our sponsors for the prizes. So it's okay if you can demo to all of them, but uh, a demo live to all of them. But as long as they have the full information on your submission page, which is a description, possibly a very recommended video, a link to where you've deployed the project so they can test it out and see everything live. Uh, that would make it easy for them to quickly do everything on their own and then ping you directly if they have any questions or clarification. And also want to talk about quickly the 
code of conduct. So it is an online event, but we still want to adhere to our rules for this community, which is, in summary, please be respectful uh, and harassment and abuse will not be tolerated in any form. So you can check out the rules and code of conduct by heading over to eatglobal.com slash rules. It outlines everything that um, we're going to be adhering to at this event, including anything that comes out of it will be an intellectual property of you uh, and no one else. So uh, please check out if you're interested in learning more about any of the rules or the code of conduct. And of course, if there's something that we missed or if you have more questions or clarifications that you would like, you can head over to um, our Discord and message anybody on the global team or message us over email by heading over or by, by sending an email to hello at eatglobal.com. All right, so now I want to quickly thank some of our amazing partners who are also going to talk about their uh, the prizes they're giving. So let's uh, jump into Alcoin and IPFS. Hi, I'm Joe Roper from Protocol Labs. We are delighted to participate in DAO Hacks to show IPFS and Filecoin. IPFS is a protocol designed to make the web work peer-to-peer. -peer. It is a trustless protocol. It ensures other actors cannot modify the data. To do that, it uses content-based addressing. Addresses are cryptographic hashes of the data, ensuring the full and forever integrity. We use IPLD, a framework to create various linked data formats. Files, post on a social network, or your own custom data, IPLD can do it all. IPFS is first and foremost decentralized, allowing anyone to join and participate in the network. The core design is really simple, meaning it can work on more or less all mediums imaginable, making it very future-proof. All of these points make IPFS the best tag for all of your web free data. Filecoin is a decentralized storage network. It allows you to pay storage providers to store your data. To do that trustlessly, storage providers must take field tokens as caution for your data and post daily zero-knowledge proofs that they still store the data. If they fail to do so, they pay penalties. It uses IPLD, as the same data format as IPFS, that makes them greatly interoperable. There is ongoing work on the Filecoin virtual machine. This is a WASM-based smart contract platform and will have an EVM compatibility layer. The Filecoin network is enormous, storing 65 pbytes currently, and the total committed space is around 16 exabytes, making Filecoin the solution for web-free data. I will be doing a workshop on April 7th, demonstrating a DAO back journal, teaching you how to use IPFS with smart contract and what content addressing can do for you. Looking forward to see you. We have rewards for your projects. We will give 6,000, 3,000 and 2,000 dollars in Filecoin to the first, second and first winner in our track. As well as a 5,000 dollar prize pool for anyone qualifying in our track. If you don't want to wait the workshop to learn more, you can use these links. On the left, you have great tutorials, and on the right, you have great easy services to get started. Awesome. So we just kind of learned about what Protocol Labs is excited to do here, and uh, we'll go into uh, quickly the prizes as well. So without further ado, let's learn about the prizes you can win for Protocol Labs. Hi, I'm Joe Roper from Protocol Labs. We are delighted to participate in DAO Hacks to show IPFS and Filecoin. IPFS is a decentralized file sharing network that uses constant addressing. Filecoin is the storage network for web free data. We have 6,000, 3,000, and 2,000 dollars in Filecoin for the first, second, and third place in our track. And we have 5,000 for anyone building on IPFS, Filecoin, NFT.storage, or Web3.storage. Thanks for listening, and have a nice weekend hacking stuff. Awesome. And uh, just to kind of talk about their prices again, so the best use of IPFS stack, which is using IPFS, Filecoin, NFT gas storage, or web gas storage, will qualify for a lot of prizes. So the first place will receive $6,000 for being the best integration. The second place will get $3,000, and third place will get $2,000. There's also a pool prize for using the same for all projects, which means that anyone who qualifies as a project will split $5,000 evenly. And next up, we have Sam from Superfluid talking about their prizes. Hello everyone, my name is Sam from Superfluid and we're really excited to be sponsoring the upcoming ETH Global event DAO Hacks this weekend. Um, we have four total prizes worth $8,000 in total. The first of those prizes is for the best overall project built on Superfluid at the event for $3,000. 
We have a prize for the best Superfluid application for Dow Finance worth $2,000. Another prize for the best use of Superfluid in NFTs for DAOs worth $2,000. And finally, a prize for the best use of Superfluid and another sponsor's tech for $1,000. So four prizes there. Um, we think that uh, this is going to be a really cool event full of DAO related technologies. And we're hopeful that there are going to be plenty of streaming related applications as well. So if you need any help, please reach out to me in, in Discord. You'll see me, Sam F. Superfluid. And our team overall is happy to give you assistance as well. Happy hacking. Awesome. And to quickly repeat the prizes that Sam just talked about, the best overall integration of Superfluid will win $3,000. The best Superfluid application for DAO Finance will receive $2,000. The best use of Superfluid uh, for NFTs and DAOs will get $2,000. And best use of Superfluid integrating with other sponsors, uh, prize or technology uh, will receive a $1,000. Then we have the graph. So the best use of an existing subgraph will win $1,500 as the prize. And there are two additional prizes here as well, which is the best new subgraph will win a $1,500 prize. And uh, the runner-up best new subgraph submission will receive 500 as well. Then we have <coughs> prizes for Lens Protocol. So the best use case of a DAO front end or tooling for Lens that uses Lens Protocol in an interesting way, uh, optimizing for DAOs will receive $1,000 for the first place and the runner-up will receive a $1,000. Then we have Skill Wallet and Skill Wallet is hosting a ID hacktivist track. So the first place of a skill water integration prize will receive $1,500. The second place will get a thousand and third place will receive 500. There's also a $1,000 pool price that's going to be split between all skill water submissions. So that $1,000 will be split evenly between everybody who qualifies for this category. Then we have covalent. So the pool prize for $4,000 is what Covalent is offering, which means that anybody who uses Covalent in a super interesting way, the APIs will be equally splitting, uh, will not, uh, we'll, we'll just splitting the, the total amount and the, the, the criteria for how it will be split will be based on different tiers that Covalent will be sharing soon on how they uh, analyze and, and measure the, the difficulty and the quality of the integration. Then we have Unlock. And the most creative use of Unlock protocol to manage uh, access to different pieces of content will receive $2,000 for the first place, $1,000 for the second place, and $500 for third place. And there's also a $500 split prize, uh, pool prize that uh, you'll be sharing, and that amount will be split equally as well. And <clears throat> all these things can be found on our website. So you can head over to dow.eglobal.com slash prizes and check out more details as well as documentation and links to their workshops so you can learn about how to use them and integrate interactively uh, as well. And finally, before we head over to our summit, I wanna quickly remind everybody to uh, please pace yourself. This is a weekend hackathon, but we don't want this to be exhausting for you. We really are doing this thing so you can learn and experiment and see what's possible. So we really want you to have fun. Uh, please don't do this thing at the cost of no sleep or something else. Uh, just try to learn um, about everything that's happening in the world of DAOs. So with that, happy hacking, and we'll see you all on Discord if you are a hacker. And again, the Discord is on ethglobal.com slash Discord. And now let's switch gears to the DAO Hacks Summit. So I wanna quickly give an overview of all the things that we're gonna talk about, and then we'll jump into our very first talk. So we're gonna do this for the next uh, couple of hours. Uh, we're gonna talk about a lot of the interesting themes that we are uh, hoping to get a lot of creative hacks around. So we're gonna kick off with just talking about what's happening in the world of discovery and curation. Then we'll jump into creation and administration of uh, these DAOs. Then there's a lot of stuff happening around managing finance and payments and anything from investments to coordinating uh, payments at scale. Then we're gonna have another interesting discussion on memberships and NFTs uh, and how we can use those two to make uh, DAOs and communities more accessible. Then everything that's happening in the world of governance and participation, uh, especially as we look to get more and more people involved. And then our last talk will be on what is um, the latest on compliance and legal and how do we actually make DAOs um, operate smoothly with the, the real world. So without further ado, let's jump into our very first talk. 
<coughs> this one is about discovery and curation. It's going to be in a panel with Rehan, Dennison, and Alicia. They're going to be talking about everything that's uh, from their perspective super interesting or things they would like to see. And Alicia will be the one moderating this chat. So I'll, I'll bring all of them to, uh, to stage here and I'll ask them to turn their videos on and I'll let Alicia take it from here. Welcome, everybody. All right, so everybody's default uh, to uh, a quick mute. So I'll ask everybody to unmute yourself and let's get started. I am unmuted. <laughs> yep. cool. Let's go. Um, hey, everyone. I'm really excited to chat to Rayhan from FWB and Denison from Tally. I'm Alicia.eth from ENS. And um, yeah, I wonder, I feel like in terms of all three of us, I wonder if just like to kick things off in terms of like what you do day to day, maybe even in life in general, like how much mind share does Dowing take up for you? <laughs> a lot. Yeah. It's it's a lot, right? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I'm I, like... I, actually, like, I woke up at like 3.45 this morning because I had um, a call like a, a working group call and then I didn't communicate something to someone and it like literally lifted me out of my sleep. So do you feel, do you feel like that? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I think um, the, the interesting thing about like doing Dow stuff or like Dowing, I like to use it kind of as a, as a verb and in the background is my baby. She babbles a lot. So you may hear her um, is so, you know, I naturally, I work on it all day for work and we're trying to think about how to solve these problems and particularly, and then outside of work, I'm in so many different DAOs and I'm trying to build different DAOs. So I'm kind of always thinking about it. Uh, for me, the thing I think that I end up like sort of consuming me is, and, you know, I, I just did like a medium post kind of about this, is that sense of like responsibility that you end up feeling towards these like communities. Sometimes you feel like kind of irrationally responsible for uh, lots of independent and then humans out in the world who are kind of like maybe looking towards you for, you know, maybe this bug and they need it fixed because they're trying to do X, right? They want to vote and the button doesn't click or uh, someone's like, well, okay, it's a DAO, but what does that mean? How does it work? Uh, are you going to do the work? Or what do you mean I'm doing the work in the DAO? I just, I just thought I just like hold the token to get rich. Like, how does that work? Um, so it, it can be very stressful. And, and, and sometimes I just have to like log off because I can't, I can't like- totally let that much wash over me. Yeah, I, I think that's probably something worth touching on a bit later too, Dennis, and I feel you on that 100%. So much of my day, I think, is thinking about both the macro and the micro of the DAOs that I'm in. Obviously at FWB, so much of it is kind of member relations, making sure the general public is taken care of, but also really figuring out how to message and promote our mission as a DAO. Because mission alignment is so key and so crucial to kind of escaping that trap of, you know, token speculators were like, oh, when's number going up, right? Because those folks oftentimes may not be the best builders or contributors. And then for contributors, it's also kind of segmenting it into, oh, here's what you can do in five minutes. And then here's, you know, how we step up, right? If you wish. Because oftentimes, you know, just as, as it is in any voting or any community, some people just want to dip their toes in the water and some people want to get in the pool. Yeah, I wonder, this is actually something I was just thinking about. If you think about your community in the DAO and you have kind of like at the like the apex, the top of the pyramid, you have like maybe core contributors, people who are really involved and then um, say that like base layer is like just token holders um, or community members that might participate in events or, you know, whatever it is online or in real life that you do. Um, how do you think about kind of like where everyone, the, the different roles that people play and like whether you have to get everyone to a certain destination or kind of like the value of each of these different components, you know, whether it is just like someone who's a token holder, um, watching the price go up, someone who, um, I don't know, how, how do you think about the different roles and does it mean that someone believes in the mission or the vision less if they're less involved? Yeah, that is a great question. I, I think on the first part, personally, I'm trying to get rid of the pyramid. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like currently the pyramid is like companies, they go to the top, right? And so, you know, my day mm -hmm. job, I'm a you know CEO, right? So you're like, there's this pyramid. Um, yeah. And that just feels like, 
bottlenecking everyone else below you, right? That has great contributions, great vision, great idea. Uh, and when we talk about like core contributors for, for DAOs, um, while I think we're at a place in time when we kind of still need that, uh, I think long-term we have to think about that's still just a kind of another tip of the pyramid, right? And that's still kind of bottleneck. Uh, and it also for some DAOs is like kind of a, a danger point, right? Cause that's like a point of capture. Like whether that's sort of like meme of like, uh, will the devs do something? That, that comment itself is very funny but it also implies something that I was just speaking about someone a few moments ago, which is who's responsible for making things happen, right? So if you have a community where, you know, we're calling it a community, but communities members say, hey, why don't the people who run this thing do something? That implies to me that actually we haven't yet fully digested the idea of a DAO, right? Because it's kind of a thing where like, no, it's not the devs, it's, it's me. Why don't I do something? Yeah. And to, to the second part of that, like, is that the difference between like community members? And I think that kind of actually is where people wake up and say, oh, this is what needs to happen. I'm spearheading it, right? Versus will the devs do something, right? Which we hear all the time. Right. I think that I, I'll disagree just a little bit, Dennis, and just in a really small nitpicky way, but so much of what I feel I do day in, day out is almost traffic and like people management in a way, in terms of who's raising their hands and who's doing what, because you also don't want the problem of like too many cooks in the kitchen, too many folks kind of submitting overlapping proposals or tapping for treasury when, you know, you have things that are maybe 80% aligned, right? Because that's not necessarily great. So some of it's also kind of building directionality. And I think that's where a core team sets the direction, the precedent, and if you will, like the kernel of the mission, if not the final mission, right? That if, you know, if you're things like, oh, I want price to go up or I want to sell out this 10K collection, like you'll operate one way, but if you want to build a lasting durable institution that is digitally coordinated, a lot of it is almost, almost religious in a way where it's like, all right, so our daily mission is to kill our ego, <laughs> and make sure that we suffuse our energy into the wider community. And like you said, allow people to contribute. So much of our view at FWB is coming from like a hardcore punk, like co-op scene where it's like, you take the tickets, you sweep the floor, but you might also be on stage. Yeah, I love that. that yeah, I, I think, you know, also to sort of like add to sort of my perspective, I think it's very like over time. As, you know, organizations in the beginning are absolutely right. You know, nobody knows what it's about in the beginning. So it is helpful that there's a group of people that feel inspired that sort of set the tone. I hope that they sort of like break up into little, you know, smaller sections or people sort of spearhead a direction. Um, you know, a, a point that I like to bring up often is in the Dope Wars community, uh, rather than there being like a leader, people sort of imbibe different aspects of the project with their own vision. Right? So it's kind of like this hip hop uh, street project, but it didn't necessarily start that way. Like I, I had created it, but I didn't say anything about hip hop in particular in the beginning. But people said, no, this is about the streets, man. And, and it sort of like created that own vibe, right? Where had I been the core dev to be like, no, it's not about the streets. It's about the Gulf and country. Um, you know, it was just been nonsense, right? So, so but I, I do agree with you. There, there is, uh, you know, people don't show up to somebody's house they want and say, oh, I'll just pitch in and start cooking, right? Because you have to sort of like instill that, like, no, this is everybody's house kind of thing. Yeah, I wonder just like, I really like that, Rehan, this idea of like sweeping the floor and being on stage. Do you think that DAOs at the moment just kind of, because we're still very early um, in this kind of new movement and paradigm, do you think that um, DAOs at the moment attract this kind of person? Have you found that in you know, your own experience? I will say personally, DAOs mm -hmm. have made me a more type A personality who are <laughs> like, you have to raise your hand, you have to step up, you have to volunteer and be like, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, you know, like Chase and I had this convo where it's like, uh, how do you let quiet contributors raise their hands mm -hmm. in a DAO? And I think that's also been a very huge challenge, not just for us on this call, but the space in general. And I would really behoove the audience to think about this as well, that you should always create kind of onboarding tracks for people with great ideas who may not necessarily, for example, want to be on, you know, Discord all day or Telegram 
or on Twitter all day, right? Every DAO needs the person who's terminally online. That's me for FWB. Um, but a lot of folks don't want to do that. So how do we build these rails for folks to step in with great ideas, but without being like the face? Yeah. Denison, what about you? Do you think that, have you found, because I feel like we are that person. Um, and I think it's also similar to like this, you know, uh, person, this like zero to one person, say in a startup, uh, like Swiss Army Nice, all, all these kind of like descriptions. Um, what's been your experience with that? Yeah, so uh, for me, it's kind of interesting. I, I am not that person in, in the DAOs that, you know, I participate in or have created. Uh, and I don't want to be that person. I think that I am actually a little bit old school. Uh, you know, being on Discord is very heavy for me. Even things like Zoom is very like psychologically bizarre to me that I'm in a very important, meaningful discussion that, you know, I can't touch you, right? Like, um, <laughs> it's also for me, I feel, you know, when you create something, there's a special kind of responsibility you have where you can say things and people take them to be truth. Right. Mm -hmm. So especially when you create communities and, you know, uh, uh, you know, there is that religious aspect to it and people do have this like sort of like, you know, clicky following aspect to it. It's very easy to say something that people just take to be like, oh, that's what we're doing. now. Oh, you know, Denison said he likes green. Change all the headers to green. Right. Uh, and then people will be like, well, maybe he didn't really say that. And they'll be like, our leader said green. <laughs> um, and and like, it's, it's weird, but like when you create something that's supposed to be a community and you, you have to really lead by example. And, you know, for me, the thing that I'm particularly really passionate or interested in is can we create leaderless organizations, right? And, and maybe I'm totally wrong on this. Maybe none of these are ever gonna really work, but it's very important to like step back from that leadership role so there's truly space for others to take leadership. And in, in Dope Wars, very early on, I took a step back really quickly and said, hey, okay, set the mechanics. This is the idea. Let's go. And people filled in all those roles on their own, right? They made a documentary, a hip hop album. They have a newspaper, there's different websites. People are building on different networks, these kinds of things. Uh, but if I were there day in, day out, people would filter things through me. Right. So um, communities do need community like stewards. Absolutely. Uh, for me, I can't be that person. Maybe it's also I'm just not good at that. Uh, right. And, and, you know, like, you know, Alicia, you'd mentioned like I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I will have some internalized grief over like maybe I wasn't polite enough in some response or like maybe I got tired answering the same question for the 10th time and I was a bit snappy. Um, and that's very hard on me. Uh, but also, it, it's, I feel like it's very important to like, leave that space for other people to lead, because when you can show that other people can lead, other people go, oh, I can lead too, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's very important, because otherwise, um, and maybe I'm wrong in this in, in some cases, otherwise, um, you know, people who step up to lead might really actually just be following. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder in terms of thinking about how to, um, especially like on board and how people show up, especially when they're kind of like trying to figure out what a community feels like to be in day to day. Um, the tools, like I personally think that the tools that we use and like the stack that we have influences so much of the experience that people have. So I wonder, and I do find it like personally quite difficult to, you know, take a lot of time to be really intentional and thoughtful and then kind of like resort to the tech stack that we do. Um, so a really basic example is just like a, a written governance forum. Um, so I basically like try to get on calls with as many people as I can, because I think that there is so much nuance that's lost in the written word. And it's just like, it's kind of like being an extrovert or an introvert. Um, it's like, you know, uh, it, it's almost like the shape rotator of words, I think, but it's not, it's not that, but it's like, you know, a, some people feel comfortable um, communicating with the written word, other people, it, they don't, but they're kind of forced into these different platforms. And um, so how do you think about creating these spaces where, I don't know, we can just be like as inclusive and um, make communities as accessible as possible for 
you know, the different ways that people shine? I have a controversial answer, Ooh, which okay. is um, build selfishly, right? You build oh for your gosh. own community. Oh my gosh. I always talk about being selfish. Okay, there we go. <laughs> you know, you know, um, because if you build what feels good for mm-hmm. you and then kind of fine tune it out and make it applicable for like someone else, like in our case, who's maybe not as culturally aligned or someone who's not as much of a, you know, discord geek or whatever, then you're going to end up finding tools that make sense. And then you bring other people into the fold and build out accordingly. Like one very specific example probably is like snapshot. I think that's a pain point for so many folks where if we think about just voting in the civic system, right? Like you have punch card ballots and you have touchscreen and all this other stuff, right? Like just the technology itself is such a barrier and we have a really big chance to automate that, make it feel kind of lived in and comfortable, almost like consumer tech as opposed to civic tech, which I think is so fascinating and interesting. And that's a space I'd want to see more people kind of deal with. At FWB, I think to the credit of like Dexter and Mike Bodge on our team, a lot of what we've built feels native to our system and our community. And we've expanded it outwards as we collaborate with more DAOs. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the tooling is obviously, you know, Tally builds a lot of DAO tooling. So this is something we think about a lot. And, you know, sometimes we wonder if, you know, uh, DAOs such as FWB have the resources to build their own tooling and their own uh, internal mechanisms. And then you have DAOs that, that don't and kind of need like a manual and they need help and how to get there. Uh, you know, you, you started talking about like the sort of governance forum and like the writing. And this is such a, hard problem, right? You know, one of the things, like we use Discord because it is such like a liquid idea layer, right? Like everything just flows, but it also trains participants to, to kind of behave badly, right? And it, it really puts a lot more work on the contributor shoulders than is really fair, I think. You know, it would be reasonable to say, please read the docs. But in an uh, environment like Discord, nobody reads the docs. And they hold you responsible for somehow having not communicated all the information in the docs to them in some medium that they would have already had a chance to go through, even when that's already there, right? So there's this really weird thing where you'll, you can, you can have something, you'll have an announcement channel or welcome channel. They'll say, Hey, welcome here. Be nice. Everyone just clicks, sure. Yeah, I'll be nice. And then they go and be mean. Uh, and then like, please read the docs to understand what's happening here. And then they come in and the first question they say is like, what's happening here. Right. Um, so discord is, and, and, you know, I feel like I'm ending up on this little like campaign against discord, which is not what it is, but there's something about those platforms where if we didn't need the sort of like FOMO, mimetic, liquid communication that Discord provides us, participants might also have the opportunity to be more thoughtful, right? Like the ability to like slowly peruse information, right? The idea that in Discord, someone comes up with a great idea and then eight hours later, somebody else wakes up in their time zone and that idea is like, just like scrolled infinitely up. Um, it's a bad experience. So, so, we spend a lot of time like, you know, trying to manage communities and essentially trying to control, you know, remember that game telephone that you play like in school where like the children pass a message around and by the end, the message is total nonsense, right? That's discord, right? And in many ways, a lot of the work of community managers is like trying to intercept every time that message gets passed from one user to another to clarify, no, 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 that's not what was said. Hey, 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 that's not what's happening. Oh, be nice. Right. Um, so I think we're still at a loss of like what the sort of ideal tool is there. Um, I personally am advocate advocating things like, you know, office hours where you just like turn it off and like it's just not available. But some sort of medium where you can have that liquid communication and that sense of community that brings it. Right. Because a lot of people are in that discord because, you know, the DAO brings them a sense of purpose and being there is a community that they're a part of but then also having an environment where you know that people are gonna go and read what it's about. You know that people are gonna 
take the work and time to be, like, be a part of it. And, and frankly, some of this is just going to come down to resources long term, like when the, some DAOs get large enough where they can have a conference, right? They'll say, OK, you know, um, let's go out to the desert and all the, the true participants will all come out here and we'll like workshop what it is that we are about and we will all get it and everyone will know. Unfortunately, not all the DAOs can do that, but I think we're going to see that more and more. Um, you know, Creator Cabins is doing, is da doing DAO camp really where it's just like, hey, you know what? We got to take people out of this environment, put it in some human forum uh, and do the discussion. But it's a very, very difficult problem slash opportunity slash place to live your life in the metaverse. Yeah, I wonder just like thinking about taking people offline into the real world and just like the impact of that in terms of building community, um, especially kind of as the world starts to open up again. How important is it for, or has it been in your own experiences to kind of feel within a community? Because like, I guess it's been really interesting for me because I've kind of just been like sitting in a room in New Zealand for the last year, um, which is like both geographically very far away and also like very isolated because I like kind of didn't really leave my room. And, um, and just to, you know, be able to see and share a meal with people, um, it's something so new. I know, I know that there are lots of online communities um, that have been built, you know, for decades and it's not new to them, but for a lot of people coming into Web3, um, coming into the DAO space, building like 99% of this relationship with others, with a community, with a mission completely online, like what is your hope with in real life and kind of just like other things outside of the metaverse? I think oh, it's a good. bandwidth thing that oh, yeah. like real life bandwidth is so different than online. Like even right here, we're still seeing each other's faces, voices and everything, mm -hmm. but there's something really special about seeing someone in person and connecting. And I also think that even in the way that people have, have manners and talk on like zoom or discord is so different than, you know, in person, I think you know, Alicia, between you and I, you would have cut me off like eight times by now. And I would have done the same <laughs> if we were in person, right? Like it's so back and forth, right? And it's it's almost closer to like jazz and freestyling than it is like something programmatic. Right. And that's kind of how I think the culture gets built for a lot of orgs. I know in our case, so many people have joined FWB and kind of understood what we're about after they go to an event or a party in person. Mm -hmm and like have experienced the community and, and what there is to, to offer. It's not like a, you know, job fair. It's closer to like a rave, a dance, a really good lunch, you know? And that's the kind of stuff that, you know, even Creator Cabins, for example, does extraordinarily well in terms of linking people up and saying, this is kind of what we're about and this is where we're gonna go. Yeah. Um... I really agree with that. And, you know, it's kind of interesting to talk about how in real life we'd be interrupting one another. And in <laughs> Zoom, you're kind of like forced to take turns. Like it's like kind of forced round robin because otherwise nobody hears anything. Uh, and like all the social cues get mixed up. Um, and then Discord is just like, nobody waits for you to finish shit, right? Like whatever, you're in the middle of talking something, GM, it's gone, right? Um, the, I, I kind of remember in like the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, there was like this t-shirt and there was like this kind of like phrase that said like, um, for like young sort of like musicians, there's like this whole scene of like early electronic indie music and they would get really popular in Japan. And so there's this kind of like meme of like, yeah, I'm, I'm really big in Japan. And I always liked that idea, how it sort of like, applies to like the metaverse, you know? Cause you know, as you mentioned, you're like in New Zealand, you're in like a room, uh, what is it? And, and like, can people really wrap their mind around what it is to say, you know, to be you, be in your room and like walk outside and go get a coffee. And someone's just like, oh, hi. And you're like, oh, and they're like, what are you doing? And you're like, I chat on the internet, but really you're like, oh, I'm a leader of a transnational global organization that's revolutionizing the, the you know, core way that humans interact with each other. But people are like, sure. You know, so it's sort of like that 
big in Japan thing. So it's like being in real life is very important to like on a subconscious level to be like, no, you're not crazy. They really do love you in Japan. You know, it's like you really need to go there for your concert and really see like, oh, wow, they really love me here, right? Like there's other people who are into what I'm doing. I'm not alone. So um, yeah, and you know, actually I'm going to see if I have the book right here. Um, so the guy who founded like CMX, the um, like community oh, yeah. management conference, and he like Thank talks you. about how his is, he, he talks about how the first time they did a community management conference, all these community managers came together and they're like, oh my God, it's real. I knew what I was doing was real and important. I knew it. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like that. <laughs> sort of see if I have it lying here. Yeah. I think maybe this kind of flows on to just like the in real life stuff and almost it's kind of like um, just like taking a breath and playing the long game, I think, especially in terms of like the the visions that of, you know, the DAOs and the communities that we're involved in. Um, it's definitely a marathon, but I know that in Web3, it can just feel like continuous sprinting. So especially kind of in the DAO space, what are the things that you do as individuals to just like keep playing the infinite game, essentially? For me, it's logging off mm -hmm. and being polite to people and saying no, right? People, you know, you'll create something and people are like, no, you have to keep building it right now, always. And, and this is what you have to build. And this is how you should do it. And everything you've done is wrong. You kind of have to just be like not internalize that and very politely be like, no, I'm going on vacation or no, I'm going to sleep. Or if you want that thing so much, please go build it. And then when people say, I don't know how to, and it's like, well, you know, ask other people in the community and like gain support, right? Like their communities can turn toxic for contributors, especially builders. You know, I've spoken to a lot of builders who, who join a community and start building something because they're just passionate about it. And, and suddenly they feel this responsibility for like owning it and they have to maintain it and people make demands of it. And, you know, why doesn't it work as good as something else that somebody else built, uh, you know, and, and that really burns people out. And the, there's this kind of silent dismissal in communities where people who, who are really passionate contributors, I'm sure we've all seen this, passionate contributors, always in there, always mediating things, and then suddenly you just don't hear from them anymore, right? Where, where they hit that burnout, where this is, is something that can be really intense. I think you have to tell yourself that you do care about this group of anonymous internet people inside of Discord, but you do care about yourself and your well being, and that you need to be like interested and up and excited at doing this thing again tomorrow. And you're just gonna have to take space for yourself for that. Totally. I'm gonna add on to that. It's almost like a, in, in some ways, that a community is almost like a tornado. You have the highest velocity on the outside. You have the most churn on the outside. You have people whipping around, you know, houses and, and cows and cars on the outside. And as you get closer to the center, it gets more calm. And it's like, as someone who is managing and building, you have to be as still as you can and, and do what it takes to, to do that. Um, and also recognize the various tiers of, of the chaos and the stillness as it moves inwards that, for, for people on the most outside denizens, to your point, it's like, all right, cool, that if you want to contribute to community, like here's our town hall for, or actually, no, if you want to contribute to product or software, here's the stage we're giving you to do that. Here's where we can triage good ideas versus bad. For community, same thing. And I think some idea of functional units or squads within a DAO are very helpful in that regard, because then all of a sudden, the stuff that we thought were blockers are less so. And of course, the way to do that is to take care of ourselves. Because if you don't, you know, a DAO is like always on. Web3 never sleeps as, as someone <laughs> sleeps. <laughs> I know, I've seen like um, enough yeah. screenshots of your sleep apps to know that you also literally never sleep. Um. Oh yeah, you know. <laughs> Shout out to the um, aura ring. <laughs> yeah, I'm too scared to get one of those. Um, but I kind of think of it uh, this is like kind of parenting advice. I feel like so much parenting advice like flows over into Dow advice, but um, something that's like really basic is fill your own cup. It's like put your own oxygen mask on first before you help others. Um, I think just like really 
really internalizing like what it means to for you know like you personally me personally to be at my best like physically is a big one I like really take you know like my whole being shifts um based on kind of like my physical activity and it's like really easy to sit in a chair for like you know 18 hours a day in the space um but yeah I think also just like having people that will um I guess like you said Denison like lead by example and um I think in terms of that culture setting it's really important but I know we are coming up on time thank you both so much this has been so much fun and I hope that everyone watching um you know learned a few things and found yeah found this valuable and you got it well Rayhan Denison thank you thank you so much for being on the panel and Alicia thank you so much for moderating I think it's thank uh, you everyone really good to see the human side of this uh, ecosystem kind of being brought to to light. And uh, there's a lot of parallels here on how you can not just contribute to DAOs, but just also how you work overall in this space. And uh, really appreciate the amazing chat. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. And with that, we are ready for our second talk, which is going to cover everything that's happening with creation and administration of DAOs. This is a panel I'm particularly super excited about because there's so many things that are happening at so many different scales. So um, I won't spoil anything we're going to cover, but I want to welcome Imran from Alliance DAO, Stefan from Taoist, who's going to be moderating this, uh, Moshe from Coordinate, and Dr. Nick from Factory DAO. So I'll let them uh, introduce themselves and the stage is yours. Welcome. Hey, hey everyone. Um, so I guess I'll start quickly. Uh, my name is Stefan Delavo. I guess I'm involved in a lot of different areas in the space. I'm mainly running the, I'm the president of the Caribbean Blockchain Alliance um, in the DAO space. I am one of the stewards of the Daoist. Um, also contributing to a, a number of other DAOs. Uh, everyone else, I guess we could start with Imran. Oh, you <laughs> yeah, I could go. Uh, yeah, so I'm one of the co-founders of Alliance, which is a Web3 accelerator program. We work with some of the best founders in industry, uh, all the way ranging from NFT marketplaces all the way to DAOs and, and DeFi. Um, yeah, so that's a quick background myself. Pass it over to Moshe. Hi, my name is Moshe. Um, I work with Coordinate, where I lead um, research studies on under the DAO landscape and understanding the DAOverse. And Coordinate is a tool for supporting decentralized compensation and culture at DAOs. Hi everyone, Alex. Oh, I, I, um, it's down to me. So um, yeah, my name's Nick. Um, I've been building DAO tools in the space for the last 18 months or so alongside some prediction market and DeFi stuff. Um, and we're launching a DAO called Factory DAO, which is a DAO that makes DAOs. Um, and it's our, it's our goal to build a kind of decentralized home for, for DAO infrastructure. And um, we kind of, we're aiming to specialize in decentralized decision-making tools. We do a lot of quadratic voting um, and um, build sort of mechanisms for fair launching of tokens and um, doing decentralized governance in new and interesting ways with NFTs. That's awesome. Uh, we'll just jump right into the questions. So this is always in one of the favorite questions I have in the space. What does everyone think about DAOs as a philosophy in terms of, you know, what do you think about the philosophy of DAOs and why are you even doing this in the first place? Um, so for me personally, uh, everyone talks about the core aspects of DAOs, which are decentralization and autonomy, but even that means different things to different people, right? So how do you think about those words in particular and, and why were you in here? Um, DAOs, what DAOs enable, um, you know, you can always talk about, you know, organization or self coordination, uh, social coordination as a tool. Uh, but if you're thinking about like the evolution of organizations generally, you have, you know, traditional organizations uh, and all the other organizations that's brought out of it. But now, what can you do with people all across the globe that are able to coordinate for a mission and vision together? Uh, Biology said this really well, uh, which is DAOs, what DAOs enable 
is the the ultimate social coordination tool that could uh, rival nation states, which I think is a very true statement. And the reason for that is because right now, like if you look at traditional organizations today, they're primarily predicated on jurisdictions and governments. And so for people, in fact, if you know about this, uh, like the history of corporations, you know that like, uh, like corporations, even in the United States, you couldn't actually do business outside of a state. Uh, and now thinking about doing business outside of United States has is like something that's not laughed at anymore because that's something where we live in a truly global organization, uh, global globalized country. Uh, and uh, what DAOs I think enable is taking it for uh, a step further, which is allowing anyone to coordinate with anyone, doesn't matter where they reside, what the mission vision is, and they're able to do this holistically with other organizations. So I'll jump in here and I'll say that I have a little bit of a bias. Well, I have a, my perspective comes from having a PhD in organizational behavior and having spent decades reading literature on like the history of organizations, corporations, nonprofits, and how they've evolved. So in many ways, I'll say like, there's not that much new about DAOs. Um, there are groups of people trying to get together and coordinate towards shared goals, like cavemen have done trying to hunt a woolly mammoth for a long time, right? Um, what... And so, and I say that as a bit of, because I'm as I watch the evolution of the space, I, I watch people come in with like philosophical ideas around autonomy, empowerment, collaboration, flattening hierarchies. And then when it starts to get hard, we've, we all, almost all of us have previous work experiences or we grew up in schools and hierarchies and bureaucracies, right? And we import those mental maps and I can see this tendency to just replicate in a distributed, disseminated web three suit anonymous space um, what's what you know? Why I left the Web two world, right? And so, what excites me about those though, at the same time is that we hold this ethos of wanting to create a sense of ownership, belonging, and autonomy, empowerment, but also collaboration, coordination, and like there's some heart and soul, and like we don't give a fuckness. Um, that's kind of like um, really inspiring to me. Like this, like this, like we're gonna this iconoclastic idealist, uh, and what kind of idealism, like this like little edge to the space that holds, that keeps us from just defaulting from a previous model, particularly as, as we scale and have to develop and have ways of funding ourselves and things like that. Um, and then I guess the other thing that excites me is you have groups that are truly more socially oriented around star, arts and social spaces that we've seen as a void in much of at least the Western culture for decades now. Um, yeah, I, I, I really like the point that, that I think you're right. There isn't, DAOs aren't radically new in the sense that we, I, I was working on decentralized organizations before the DAO was around. And that, that notion of, of, of decentralized organization has been around for a long time. It's, a, it's not a new paradigm in itself, but I do see DAOs as the facilitator of these things. Mm -hmm. So they're difficult to scale um, without these, without Web3 tooling. And, and I, you can think of organizations, traditional organizations, almost like pyramids of power. And DAOs are almost like the opposite. The goal is to, to decentralize power. To, the goal is to give power away. Um, and, the, the, and I think that's, that for me is like a philosophical shift that's happening. And DAOs are almost like the inflection point between centralization and decentralization. And they can collapse back to these centralized notions. In fact, they all kind of start fairly centralized. But the goal is to distribute power out to as, as many participants as possible. And that's that for me is the kind of root of the Dow philosophy for me. Yeah, I, I really like these points about, you know, this long history of decentralized governance. The fact that this isn't really anything new, it's just a slightly different form using different technology. Um, I think that kind of goes into the next question, especially Moshe, how you mentioned that a lot of times people start off, you know, really being passionate about DAOs or really wanting to explore and then they kind of revert back to to what what they're already doing before in a more centralized direction uh so in, especially when we talk about things like that how do we make sure we actually build and contribute to the evolving of a healthy uh dao culture or a healthy dao ecosystem mm. yeah i think that's a great question and i i really liked uh nick's point around power has a tendency it, there's a tendency for power to coalesce and centralize um, and I'll say even like the first DAO I worked at, like in 2018, which was a cooperative, like 
was flat and had no titles and no hierarchies. And what it meant was like all the power informally got coalesced around the founder who had a really hard time giving it away. And that, and that uh, had a pretty direct correlation to the demise of that organization. Um, and so I think there's like that, um, there are a couple ways you can support such a culture, right? One is um, I've seen some really great admins like who are not necessarily the founders with the vision who people look to. <clears throat> There's like a disaggregation between the founder, the visionary who has all this tacit power and the admin is really holding and sustaining like the ethos, the values of the place and maintaining safety, right? I think another way I've also seen culture be sustained, which is a little counterintuitive is um, yes, Dallas and theory, theory are inclusive, porous boundary, have inclusive, porous boundaries, but you gotta know who you are, your essence is. And so I think of it as like concentric circles of trust, intimacy, and commitment and proven capability and contribution to the DAO. And so being clear about what those circles are and like what we're at at our core and who's, who's sustaining that, but also letting that be porous. More people can come in and sustain, hold the view of the DAO. And that's different from the folks in the Discord channel who are saying, we're trying to micro regulate the price of the token, right? So also having that sense of here's our, like we're working really hard to coordinate about our, our mission, our values, what we're about. Um, and then um, and then we're also, and we're defining that and we have a whole community that we engage with as well, right? As part of that process, but there's delineations. And the last thing I'd say is, um, is remembering that we're all about humans working with humans and because of web three and no video and disaggregation, like making time for the human relational conversation. So we're connecting person to person. When we see like bad actors arise in a coordinate circle, it's often, I ask when I probe into it, it's like, well, we haven't even heard each other's voices and we work together for months, right? So there's no feedback, there's no relationship building that are like critical in any organization or any group of people. So those are the things I think about. The, the way we think about it within Alliance, Alliance DAO, is we actually don't open up our, you know, we think of ourselves as a traditional company in the sense where we don't allow the community to be involved in what we do. We actually go through an interview process for those that want to be a part of our community. And we look for ways where they can support us in different types of areas of support. So there's like four, right? Like product, engineering, marketing, uh, and then like collaborations or partnerships and marketing. And... And so once we interview these individuals, we figure out like how much time they can actually commit to the DAO and if they're committing to other DAOs. The problem that we have today is that we have too many people that are involved in too many different DAOs and then they ultimately, um, you know, they don't have any time to actually like do real work. And so we look for time and how much they can support us. Uh, because over time, what you're doing is like part-time work as, as Moshe mentioned, right? Like, you know, these are real organizations that are going to need actual support from the community. So um, what we call them is like frontline contributors. And we, uh, they're re relatively speaking, they'll have about 20 hours of time that they can spend. Uh, and that's kind of like the first like foundation of what our DAO is. Then we have like core contributors and we have work stream contributors and they actually spend full time working for the DAO. Um, but, you know, that's kind of how we think about from a hierarchy perspective. It's just like, you know, how do we get real work done and how do we make sure that this organization moves its milestones so that it can continue be, to, be, to be around in the next five to 10 years? Interesting. Um, yeah, I think in terms of the next stage of DAO designs that build a sort of healthier community, I think I'm really interested in governance systems that arise from sort of non-financial power. So we've you've got, NF, we look at NFT governance and use a kind of combination of NFTs and quadratic voting to assign voting budgets or voting allowances to individual NFTs. And then those individual NFTs can have elevated voting power that can be generated from contribution. Um, so contribution driven governance power and influence in DAOs is probably where I think the, the healthiest and strongest communities come from. And rather than just being disempowered people that where there's four or five people that genuinely control the token supply and consequently all the decision making. Um, so I think that's, that's probably where the, that direction is going to move to, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, when we look at these communities, the, all of you raise excellent points, especially in terms of you know, how do we actually manage these communities? How do we make sure work is actually being done? People don't get overburdened. Everyone, 
falls for the same, you know, problem sometimes about, oh, this is cool, this is cool. And then you end up with, you know, a million servers on your Discord. Uh, and then you get caught up with, uh, a lot of people get caught up with, you know, jumping from thing to thing without being able to focus. Um, and what I like about this is that all of you are kind of focused in different areas, especially like, for example, Alliance is more DeFi focused. Um, what do you all think of, I guess, what is no one, what do you all think no one is really talking about or is not talking about enough in this space in terms of like potential issues or challenges or even just more of the good things? Um, I, I, I think token economics isn't discussed as much as potentially um, it could do. Um, I think there's, there's a huge amount of engineering to be done around a healthy token ecosystem around it. Um, where it just kind of all doesn't descend. So distribution of tokens on uh, initial, um, uh, on the spin-up of a DAO, um, if all those tokens end up too centralized around early contributors, for example, then you're going to find it very difficult to find people coming late to the to the DAO and, and being properly incentivized with it. But also thinking in a sort of sustainable way, it's, it's a really easy way to burn out a DAO very quickly um, by sort of either issuing tokens too quickly or not thinking long-term enough with them. Um, so I think that's a real, um, a, a really interesting dynamic of better treasury management, uh, better incentive alignment that lasts for longer terms. Um, so I think that's a, it's a really interesting place that I, I don't think it's talked about quite as much as it should be. I agree with that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, I'm, I want to build on that and say, I think, more broadly, it's like thinking long term and understanding a world of constraints and the, the mirror image of like the ethos with which we're starting with DAOs with. And it mirrors like the general life cycle of startup, early stage startups, which are all about like try a million things, spend money. Yes, come help us. We're desperate for anyone. And then with scaling, it's like, how do you really manage constraints, finite budgets, creating hierarchy and deciding we have five awesome people doing design, which of them kind of leads or initiates the group in some way, because we need some coordination points as we move from 15 to 150 folks. So like, and how do you do that without undermining uh, and like the treasury management without undermining the ethos of what we're here to do, which is like decentralize and empower people, but it gets exponentially harder with, with, uh, with scale. Um. I, I completely agree. Like token economics has been one of the lacking like focuses in crypto. In fact, you know, if you look at like token economics with the VE standard that Curve came out with, you've noticed like a, a, a I would say a portion of protocols that pivoted to that model that shows you kind of the naive space that we're in. Uh, I still think the VE model hasn't been tested yet to its extent. Uh, but speaking about DAOs and tokenomics, that's also a very interesting topic, which is like, do we airdrop everyone in the community a token? Mm -hmm. Do we allow everyone to, uh, do we distribute our tokens based on activity? I mean, those are types of conversations I'm hearing about. One area that I think could be super interesting is um, uh, a, a rewarding contributors based on the work that they've done for the DAO. So instead of opening up the race to everyone in the community, um, find the people that are going to be most relevant for, for the DAO, get them to commit time to the DAO, give them the token sale, and then uh, have other options that reward based on KPIs of the DAO. Um, Uma Protocol has a, pro, uh, a, pro, a product, uh, it's called the DAO KPI product, and it allow, essentially allows token sale investors to get an additional call option on the token sell if the DAO KPIs are hit, which I think is very, very relevant to, to how we not, uh, push DAO progression forward with the community in mind. Yeah, <laughs> totally agree as well on the token economic side. I mean, it, it's interesting because now it's extremely easy to spin up a DAO, very easy to create a new token, which obviously is a good thing, but also kind of takes away or has the potential to take away a lot of the intentionality behind you know, what you're trying to create because people sometimes don't realize like when you're starting, when you're creating a token, you're actually creating an actual economy and which means you also have to kind of manage or at the very least facilitate this economy. So it, all these points are excellent, especially in terms of, all right, so we have this, what do we, what do, we do next? How do we make sure the, pe the right people are being paid or the right people are at least being incentivized? So that, that's extremely important. Um, 
I do want to ask a, a, a fun question. What What are you most excited about in terms of this DAO ecosystem, um, especially in terms of what's coming next? So, for example, I'm really excited about uh, more DAOs popping up from the global south. Um, obviously, m- much of the space is still very much US, UK based. I really want to see what happens when more people in small communities and more diverse communities get a hold of these tools. And I think that's going to cause this space to look very different too in terms of like, what other people are doing. Uh, so what are you guys most excited about? Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, um, uh, so I, I'll, I'll quickly go. So I think I'm really excited about this, um, the moment when the idea starts to captivate everyone. I think there's going to be a moment where DAOs go the way of NFTs and then everyone's getting super excited about it. And then we just get a whole load of new people getting very excited about crypto. But via DAOs, I actually think they have a huge mass adoption potential. Um, and I, I just, I'm just really excited about that moment where we'll have something, some DAO somewhere or something will captivate the public's memory, uh, imagination. It sort of happened with Constitution DAO very fleetingly. Um, but there's, go, there's going to be some other events where DAOs start to hit mainstream culture and, and um, where collective creativity um, examples start to happen in, in, the, in, in full view of the public. And it's going to be very exciting. Um, I, I think it's going to be too far ahead, but like I'll throw it out there because I think it's pretty cool. Um, the ability for DAOs to collaborate with other DAOs could be very interesting. Um, so as long as there's shared incentives for both DAOs, right? The question, and, and this is where I think a lot of hard work is going to get, go into is like aligning, um, you know, mission and vision and goals of both DAOs and being able to have KPIs that can solve the problems for both. Kind of like a traditional JV. Um, and the reason why I say this is important because like if we're going to start to see more and more DAOs on based on collective missions and visions and products, then you could also say that they're ultimately like money Lego similar to DeFi, right? And if that's the case, then I think a lot of cool uh, collaborations could take place where it didn't before, because today we're kind of constrained based on jurisdiction, monopoly types businesses and you know power given to certain types of individuals. Now being given that to the community and the people with the sh- strongest like you know nature of like how they're building out those products, I think there could be some in, very interesting collaborations that can come out of it. Yeah, and so I'm gonna build on those points and say, I think there's a way in which DAOs are going from just DeFi to take uh, having an influence in more and more parts of the economy. And eventually also can start to be used as governance structures and systems to displace things that are even more based on hard or solid things, right? So eventually looking towards the toilet paper factory you know, that has kind of a DAO system overarching your management or the collective of, of people who have some, like I like friends with benefits has some in real life and virtual components, right? And so that's what excites me. And what also excites me about that vision is like, there are a lot of people to teach how to DAO. And I'm excited about the conversion process to be like, what are the mindsets? How do you kind of deprogram that old way of relating in an organizational system and have it feel more like relating to family and friends and a more community oriented mindset than a transaction, a hierarchical mindset. And like that conversion process of how do we take these structures from like DeFi and other parts of web three into not even necessarily web two, right? Like the ecosystem of humans and teach people how to get there easily is, is super exciting to me. Yeah, that's awesome. Also, Imran totally read my mind because I was going to ask next, what do you guys think about DAO to DAO and how the future of DAO collaboration is going to, going to evolve. But I mean, excellent point that I think that's so important because we need even even now we still see a lot of DAOs kind of acting in silos but when they, we actually start to connect them together it's going to like blow everything up because we're going to see more and more just communities interacting with each other growing together DeFi protocols working together uh social communities building with each other creating new causes and all these things together so that's going to be amazing to see um I guess, is there anything else that you're excited about? Or, or what are you thinking about in terms of the future of how your own DAO or group of DAOs are going to operate? Or, you know, Moshe, for example, how to coordinate or how specific tools are going to evolve? What do you see as your specific futures? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we're still like um, honing in on that, but I would say like uh, I'm here in uh, in Berkeley, California on an offsite with my team. We're working through all these questions. I will say like when we're designing, we're looking within the DAO and thinking about members and mem members incentives and, and, and how do you create an amazing experience for them as individuals and have them add up to something for the DAO. But we are thinking as much around the DAO to DAO ecosystem and the metaverse of DAOs and how they collaborate, share information, and also like there's, we're thinking a lot about um, privacy versus like transparency as an ethos, right? But what should be transparent and what should be private and learning a lot about that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but if I'm a member looking to join a DAO, like there's a dating process. If you think of this whole ecosystem, there's a dating process like, like okay, Cupid wise, like me and this DAO want to get to know each other. Can you give me some signals around fit for the DAO? Mm -hmm. And what are the signals you're looking for that can be also verified um, um, in, with, through various ways to get to know me, my experience, and my fit in the DAO? Um, so that's one thing I'm thinking about. And then like, what are the data you want to collect um, to understand culturally my contributions to the DAO? And then what's the data I want to track to understand my experience across like the eight DAOs I've been involved with in the past two years and how I learn and evolve and signal that to the world. So those different levels of individual uh, uh, are definitely things we're thinking about, and how do you how do you use those data to support everyone in the ecosystem? Um, what we're thinking about a lot is um, uh, is hierarchy within the DAO, right? Um, it's 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 actually it's pretty hard um, because uh, before we had a CEO and you have like, you know, COO and all of the other hierarchies that kind of roll down from there. Uh, how do you build a community first organization, right? An organization that all ultimately plugs into the community. And how do we do this right? Because you only have one shot at building a, a strong organization that's long lasting. And so we're taking a very, you know, a very tight knit approach, which is we'll start off as like a core team that looks very similar to like a traditional company. And then slowly over time, you slowly bring in the community in certain aspects where you could, where the community can help you scale. And you do that through like vetting and understanding who are the types of community members that you can actually allow into your DAO. Um, and so we've, we've been thinking a lot about that and in, in the way we scale out to the community. Um, the, <clears throat> this idea of hierarchy is really interesting. It's actually one of the things that, um, yeah, I, I, I think we mentioned it earlier, but if, if you presume a to totally flat organization, it can descend into this kind of tyranny of structurelessness problem where they're just the most powerful people dominate. Um, and actually, one of the things we're super excited about is um, what we call a meta DAO structure, which is um, sub DAOs, which can almost like build these kind of fractal organizational structures where you can use NFTs to create dynamic membership within a DAO that's domain specific and possibly even build reputation systems out of who's con who tracked contribution in those domains and then weight decision making based on who's performed in certain disciplines and and so I, I think there's, I'm really excited about that, that dynamic of where governance, uh, where governance tools are going um and building out pseudo hierarchies where these different communities within a DAO might become more important for some things more than others um uh, but they're kind of fluid and open um so yeah i think that's um that that kind of new era of decentralized governance is about mm -hmm. to begin i think yeah um I'm also excited about new DAO tooling that's going to be coming out to help support all of what we're talking about. Uh, there's so much that's out there, but I think there are few that could be very, very important for how DAOs operate in the, in the landscape today. So I'm yeah. pretty excited about that. And I'll just say that, yeah, everything you all just said, I'm just pretty excited because that is the direction we're around hierarchies and all that is and nested parts of these organisms that kind of self-replicate, but stay in a, their own bubble is part of how we're envisioning coordinate. And we're really clear that like, there's a bunch of things that DAOs need tooling around and someone else is doing that super well. And so we will be figuring out how to integrate and, co and collaborate with those tools as seamlessly as possible um, <clears throat> in support of that vision. And so it's really fun to be in our own side of DAO tooling. And I'm like, yes, to everything you said. 
and recognizing parts of what you just you, you shared will be addressed by other tools that we're we're watching and and uh, collaborating with, which is a very different ethos than um, at least when I was working in the prior Web two world. Yeah, I like that a lot. I mean, it kind of expands on the doubt it out collaboration, the mm -hmm. doubt tools, the doubt tools collaboration, which is a whole other kettle of fish. Um, no, it's awesome. I think we're coming up on time. I think we have time for one more quick question. But actually, Nick, I wanted to expand on something you mentioned earlier in terms of DAOs actually being, you know, where a lot of the mass adoption of crypto comes from. I was wondering if, if you and the other guys could expand on that a little bit before we close. Um, yeah, just so that the reason why I think that might happen is because the if you look at just the way that we we've evolved into using the internet, it's it's largely around the the really striking things that have happened around community formation. So the things we're already doing, we're in chat groups, we're in you know subreddits, we're in forums, we're in discords, we're already doing this kind of. It's something that most people do on the internet already. And I just feel like there's there's this potential hop out of, um, of of those practices into DAOs that can happen that really uh, people will just experience one almost peripherally, see the power of it and uh, potentially do some wild stuff that like wouldn't normally have happened with that if the DAO idea wasn't there. And, and I think it could really like captivate humanity of like, oh, wow, there's a whole new possibility space for how we can use these communities we're in. And everyone will look at that WhatsApp group a little bit differently for a bit, and it'll be super exciting. Yeah. If I could share one more thing, building on that, like if I talk to my teammates, they're like, this is the most awesome work, ex quote unquote, work experience I've ever had. And we're making really cool shit. And I hear that pretty consistently from a lot of people in this space. And to me, that is the proof. Not only we're doing interesting things, but people are the happiest they've ever been collaborating to make stuff happen in the world. And I think that's, that's necessary for the vision that Nick and Imran have been articulating to, to come to fruition. Well, I want to thank <laughs> Yeah, okay, so this has been an amazing chat. I, I'm particularly interested in uh, maybe bringing you guys back um, in the future to kind of cover more about the hierarchy. I think this is uh, something that kind of constantly go back and forth, whether it's culturally or just from an ideological standpoint. So a lot, of, a lot of interesting thoughts there. I personally agree with what you said, Imran, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think these things also have to be a uh, variable based on the scale uh, of the community too. So uh, I'm, I'm curious to see if there's more, more thoughts that we can share and go into this topic specifically in the future. So I want to thank all of you again. And Stefan, thank you so much for moderating and uh, really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks for having us, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. And with that, we are ready for our next talk. So next up is... We're going to cover the category of finance and payments. Of course, uh, DAOs are fundamentally managing payments and companies at scale, uh, whether they're on chain or off. And uh, there's so much room for not only just improvement, but automation, rethinking, and just coming up with brand new ways to understand and solve these problems. So to kind of bring on this uh, behemoth of a topic, uh, I want to invite Anubhav, Jason, and Monty on, on stage. And uh, Monty will be the one moderating this uh, panel. So I'll let her kick this off. And uh, welcome, everybody. Great to see all of you here again. Thank you, Karthik, for having us. Always excited to be at an ETH Global event. Um, hey, everyone. I am right now in Miami at the Bitcoin Miami conference, but joining in just for this amazing panel. Um, quick introduction on myself before I go. I let um, both Jason and Anubhav introduce themselves. Um, I've co-founded Komorebi DAO, which is an investment DAO focused on investing in female founders and non-binary founders in the crypto space. Um, outside of that, my day job is at Skynet Labs, where we are building the decentralized storage and application hosting layer for all of Web3. So I'm excited to dive into the finance and payments conversation today. That's my background before crypto. I worked in the traditional finance industry. So exciting to see what we are doing in the DAO space with that. But with, um, without further ado, Jason, you want to go next? Just quick introduction. And then Anupal, love to hear your background too. Absolutely. Thanks, Manasi. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jason. I'm the CTO of Utopia Labs. Uh, Utopia Labs started about seven months ago. Uh, we handle all the payroll and expense management for DAOs. 
Um, pretty much we want to tackle the entire financial stack for DAOs and handle all the back office tasks um, and make sure that creating a DAO and operating DAO is just really simple. Um, yeah, and I think we'll dive into that today. I'm really, really excited to um, chat with both Manasi and uh, Anubhav here. I think Parcel and uh, Komorobi are fantastic companies. So thanks for having me on this panel. Thank you, Anubhav. Yeah, um, so um, I'm Anubhav. I founded Parcel about a year ago. Um, and as, as a background, I was working with a few Web3 companies um, like Instadap and Bikonomy before starting Parcel. Um, and it grew out of a need uh, that a previous company like Bikonomy faced. And um, yeah, it's been a year now, and we've, we've been working with uh, a lot of DAOs, uh, you know, including Bankless, Index, and Olympus to sort out their payments. And we're kind of building the payment OS for DAOs and contributors. Thank you both. Um, before we dive in, I'm just very curious, what problem did you notice in the DAO space that made you start your respective company? What was the challenge that you, you know, set out to solve? Yeah, I can go first. Um, yeah, uh, it, it, it's funny when we uh, when we started Utopia Lab. So to give some context on our, our co-founders, we're four co-founders and uh, we actually all met on Discord beforehand. So we, we never met in person when we started the company and we did a lot of random hackathons and we're trying to start something together. Um, I never thought we would end up in DAO tooling. Uh, for that matter. Um, a lot of the stuff we were doing in the beginning was stuff like NFT marketplaces. Uh, so ending up in DAO, such a niche like DAO tooling at the time was, was uh, pretty surprising. And the kind of how we arose to that was that we talked to a lot of DAOs. We thought um, DAOs was an interesting uh, problem space to explore. Uh, and what we just found out was that the operations of the DAOs were just so primitive. They're just on a bunch of Google Sheets, a bunch of manual processes. DAOs are supposed to be okay. quite transparent, right? right? Um, none of them had single sources of truth. Um, some contributors know what's going on. Most contributors don't. And maybe a few set of operators uh, know what's going on. And they're spending like weeks on payroll when um, in the traditional world, payroll is supposed to be payroll is supposed to be something that's um, relatively easy. Um, and when you think about crypto as a payments infrastructure, it's a clear 100,000 X improvement over the current state. So when you have a payment infrastructure that's just supposed to be um, leap years better than traditional, I guess, Web2 world, um, but the operations make it so you're spending more time on payroll, it just didn't really make sense to us. So that's when we decided, hey, maybe we should dive into this space and see what problems we can explore. Um, that's kind of why Utopia is tackling payroll and expense management. But really, we're just we're just trying to see what interesting problem spaces there are um, and find the gaps that are stopping DAOs from being able to scale into huge organizations or just huge groups in general. Um, yeah, that's that's how we started Utopia. Yeah, that makes sense. And you're bringing the autonomous part of DAO, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, Anubha, is it kind of a similar story there with um, you know the challenges that you saw? Kind of. Actually, we actually started back in late 2020, and and DAOs are not a rage back then, right? So uh, we're working with uh, you know Biconomy, and fun fact, they're, they're a DAO now. But uh, we started because Biconomy was facing a problem, and I was working at Biconomy as a blockchain developer. So. Um, yeah, we were a small team of eight people and even then you know doing um the payments from gnosis safe which is, is kind of the standard even back then um and then run your payroll and then you know uh, do accounting all of that stuff was was a mess so i built a small hack um, at a hackathon back then and it all started back then um but we quickly realized we were, we're actually building for DAOs. uh you know when uniswap grants launched and when you you saw um you know Com token launch uh, with their LM program, and then um, we saw a bunch of DAOs explode, and and we realized we're, we're building a self custodial solution, which is not just for Web three companies, but it's actually building for DAOs. Um, and since then, the product has evolved to meet the needs of DAOs, and that's that's how we we started. Yeah, and I guess you know to set context, what are some different models of compensation structures that you've seen across DAOs? Is it you know looks pretty much similar to traditional models? Um, there there are new things, new and exciting things that DAOs are experimenting with. Of course, there's the fiat plus token compensation uh, model. I'm just curious, what have you seen so far? 
Yeah, I, I can I can go first. Um, yeah, I, I think right now we're we're at that stage where um, we're trying to build um, the first layer, which is kind of get the salaries out first, right? So do a fa fair compensation um, for all the operate for all the contributors in a DAO, and and you know we've seen few ways to to do that. I mean. Um, most of it is happening um, like a top down, a top down um, structure that usually a traditional company might follow. Uh, we've seen a few tools like Godnave where it's actually extremely decentralized and um, that's kind of other way of achieving this. But largely in terms of compensation structure, we're kind of, uh, we kind of lack the tools for incentives, you know, something like bonuses, even bonuses and um, you know, other benefits that a traditional corporation might be able to provide. So um, that's precisely, I think, uh, what um, the DAO tooling is, is trying to do with, uh, with you know, Utopia and Parcel and all the, all the other DAO toolings. Yeah, absolutely. I think Anubhav's, uh, what Anubhav said was, was very correct. Uh, DAO compensation models are very top down right now, um, very traditional. Yeah, you your core contributors. Yeah, maybe a set of con um, contractors. All the decisions kind of happen. Um, generally from the top, uh, which is kind of counterintuitive when you think about governance in a DAO, um, where you really want um, spread out decision making, uh, when, especially in something when it comes to compensation. And yeah, there, it, I think it depends on kind of where, where you are as a DAO, right? DAOs are a huge spectrum, um, both from there's two spectrums really that I think of. Um, there's a regulatory spectrum spectrum, whether you're compliant or not compliant and, and, and you go along that path. And then more importantly, it's how decentralized you are, right? Um, there's lots of DAOs that um, are less, de that are very decentralized. And um, I, I would say there's not too many DAOs that are very decentralized and most DAOs are kind of somewhere in the middle. And that's why the structure is still very top down. Um, so some of the problems is how can we build tools to one, allow more of these decentralization and autonomy. I think Coordinate is a fantastic tool for that, for payments that Anubhav brought up. Um, uh, but the, we're kind of thinking about these tools that we can help push DAOs into decentralization, decentralizing more or um, operating their operations um, in a more autonomous way can kind of help us alleviate these problems and come to an end state of DAOs that really we dreamed of when um, everyone wanted to create one. Um, yeah, but I think it's pretty accurate representation of where we are right now uh, as an industry. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is most DAOs, it's essentially um, not crowdsourced in terms of how to structure these compensation models, the benefits models. It's essentially core contributors deciding how to do it. Um, are they even putting out you know, governance proposals to approve it or just like behind the scenes, this is the structure, this is what we can offer. And then contributors have to kind of go around different DAOs, choose what works for them, what doesn't work for them. Is there some kind of feedback loop that you've seen or it's pretty much set and done? Yeah, there's definitely feedback loop for sure. Um, I mean, operators have been um, kind of very considerate of, of which um, structure they want to put in place. Um, as Jason mentioned, there are a handful of mature DAOs, right? So they're kind of, you know, uh, doing more of, more of the experimentation within um, how to allocate to different contributors, um, you know, and, and we see that, uh, you know, some DAOs uh, actually do it better than the others because of their experimentation and the previous results that they've gotten out of it. Um, and just just on that front, you know, there's not enough experimentation in, term, in terms of DAO tooling. So we, we kind of talk about there are more DAO tools than DAOs, right? It's it's all over or all over Twitter as, as we see it. But um, there's definitely not enough experimentation in this regard, uh, where you have you know the whole spectrum of um, allocating um, compensation. But uh, it's either you know extremely decentralized, which might or might not work for all DAOs. Or it's uh, you know top down hierarchical uh, that you would see in a traditional corporation. Yeah, hopefully that changes. Um, I guess you know if someone in the audience is considering launching a DAO, what are some key considerations that they should think about when they are thinking about their payments? You know, just uh, even compensation structures. What are maybe 
to solidify the question, are there certain thresholds that you've seen for contributors to get compensated versus, you know, it's voluntary compensation, uh, voluntary contribution, just how should someone launching a DAO think about compensation? The, the way I, I, I see it, um, well, when it, when it comes to compensation for DAOs, right, we, I, th I think it depends kind of how you um, want to operate from the get-go. So uh, we kind of, ha uh, uh, we have this thesis at Utopia that um, centralization in the beginning sometimes isn't a bad thing because it leads to um, operational efficiency, uh, you can make decisions faster, especially if you're building something um, that is less ambiguous and you kind of need to, you know exactly what you need to do and you kind of just need to get it done, right? Um, you don't really want to have that bottleneck of decentralized decision making and then you can decentralize later, right? There's a lot, there a lot of products in the crypto space that have done this, right? Uh, for example, Uniswap was very much so that. Uh, OpenSea seemed like it was supposed to do that, but it hasn't done that. Um, but lots of products kind of start out in this way and decentralize later on. Um, and that's kind of the, the thesis that we're trying to do here at Utopia as well, which I think allows us to kind of build faster um, versus decentralized autonomous making. Well, um, on the flip side, when you're working on relatively new innovative products and uh, protocols that you kind of want community involvement, right? So a lot of um, there's some products like Ohm that starts fully decentralized right from the get-go with individual contributions. Um, I think you kind of have to weigh that trade off of where you are, what you're trying to build and kind of what works for you. Do you want to build a community that kind of allows that um, voluntary contribution? Um, the, the, both models have been proven out pretty well. Um, I would say the fully decentralized from the get-go model is a bit more ambiguous, uh, though it is very closely aligned with the ethos of what your end state is going to be, what decentralized autonomous organizations are going to be. Where, um, versus if you go the centralized route, sure, you might be able to... Um, might be able to get more done if efficiency is your issue. Um, but then you have that ambiguous over looming question of how the heck do we decentralize later on, right? Um, it, yeah, so I apologize for not giving a definitive answer. I wish it was that simple where you kind of like the slot. Um, but I think, but from what we've seen uh, here with, with talking to uh, the DAOs we know, it, it, nothing just fits in a template um, in DAO land, right? Every, almost every DAO is different in some aspect with regards to each other. Um, I think it's a question that um, as we mature as an industry, we'll learn more about and be able to um, answer better. Uh, but right now, uh, that, that, that's kind of the where, where, I, where my head's at. Yeah, I, I would mostly agree to what, what Jason said. There is, there is no template, right? So um, that's kind of the beauty also that you are free to experiment with what you feel like. Um, but at the same time, I think, um, First of all, I think it, a lot depends on what kind of a DAO you are. You know, investment DAOs are very different from from a DeFi DAO versus an NFT DAO, um, and I think we'll we'll start to see specific DAO tooling is uh, with with kind of types attached to uh, all of these uh, DAOs as well. Um, but yeah, largely, I think I would uh, I would be in the section where if there's a decision to be made around compensation and payments in a DAO, just aim for operational ex uh, efficiency at at the beginning. Um, uh, you know. You don't want to, you know, compromise the product that you might have built uh, for the sake of, uh, you know, going decentralized at first. There's always room for progressive decentralization. Yeah. So those are valid points, and I think operational efficiency is so important. Given, you know, that's not necessarily the key focus of a DAO, right? Like you want to make sure those processes don't take much of your time and you can focus on the mission or the product that you're building. Um, so in that way, you know, what are the toolings that are that exist right now to make these things easy? What are you building specifically with Utopia and Parcel to make all of this seamless? I guess I'll go first. Um, yeah, so at Utopia, kind of what we're building or what we have right now is primarily we're a payroll and expense management tool. What that means is that um, any DAO or any Gnosis Safe multi-sig really can sign up to our platform, um, manage contributor lists, um, and 
create recurring payouts that they set as a time frequency um, and send out a, a request link to their, their communities where the contributors can request for X amount of money from the DAO. Um, so really just simplifying the payments layer for DAOs as much as possible to kind of um, allow them to execute. We we'll also do some interesting things on the execution layer, um, mostly around we're trying to make it as easy as possible to uh, execute um, in a way that's gasless, right? Um, so you don't have to have gas in your wallet, which I think is a poor experience, uh, though we're still experimenting with that um, and also just creating a signing page that just make, makes more intuitive sense. I think one, one issue is that um, signing is a big bottleneck in, um, in DAOs right now, though it kind of makes sense for decentralization, right? You got to have multiple people sign off off stuff. Um, though it makes the experience better. So we're trying to build tools to kind of like augment and abstract the experience of uh, multi-sig um, multi complexities so that there's a smooth uh, payroll. Um, over the next, or the short term though, really the areas that we're really trying to tackle are around the bookkeeping, accounting, um, and uh, sub DAO space. So really how do you manage your DAO organizations? How do you tag your transactions and um, do proper accounting. And then from the accounting, um, how do you create budgets so that um, you can make sure that you're on track, uh, you can offset autonomy um, to smaller groups, right? Like if you can have your marketing team have a hundred dollar budget and make a, a marketing decision for that hundred dollars or a thousand dollars without having to sign off from the actual multi-safe owner, right? Like you should be able to do that and assign uh, autonomy and assign privileges. Um, and or even create small sub towns or team leads. So we're really trying to explore that space. Um, really, uh, what that means is that the core problem we're tackling is around the coordination layer, right? The big challenges is, um, like I said at the beginning, DAOs are supposed to be transparent. Um, there needs to be a single source of truth for all the information of a DAO. And we're trying to kind of be that uh, layer where as, as a source of truth, but also um, the more data that we're able to allow DAOs to get and allow um, and help DAOs create um, the better decisions you can make, especially around payroll and um, fi uh, and payments, um, so that you're you're making the right payment decisions and coordination decisions um, for DAO uh, operations. Um, but that's kind of our short term roadmap. Is really around this coordination layer. Uh, yeah, that's utopia. Yeah, and I think you know. One thing at KomoDB that we faced as a challenge is expense management, especially because most DAOs have treasuries in crypto versus your expenses are in fiat. Um, and there is, you know, till we reach a world where crypto is accepted in most places, I think that's still going to be a challenge. And each time you make that conversion, there's tax liability. Um, so that's definitely been a big pain point just in terms of how do you interact with real world when your treasury is on chain? Um, yeah, any thoughts there? Or yeah, and above, you could chime in. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I think so. Just to just to uh, answer what you said, I think uh, this definitely, um, you know, some friction or you know a lot of friction uh, because uh, DAOs are unregulated. Right, there's there's no playbook for registering a DAO right now. So that's kind of the biggest bottleneck while you're interacting with um, the the other world. Um, yeah, I, I think it's. I think some is something Utopia is also trying to solve. So kudos to that. Um, I think they're looking to solve for compliance. Um, I think so. On on the other front, where where we are working at Parcel is uh, building, trying to build more um, native tooling, which is is kind of primitive uh, from here on. So we kind of build, uh, you know, on top of Gnosis Safe. Uh, it's been over nine months since our launch, and uh, we're, we're aiming to build the payment OS for the contributor economy. So it's not just DAOs, but we're also kind of looking to empower DAOs um, right now. Um, I'm sorry, contributors as well. So um, right now you see, um, you know, DAOs are the only ones who are, who are kind of um, looking to scale their operations. But on the other side, there are contributors who are kind of also struggling to, um, you know, contribute to multiple DAOs and how they handle um, you know, incoming payments from each one of them, how they are the off ramp, all of that uh, payments if they wanted to. Um, and we see, you know, uh, the multiple struggles around, um, you know, you receive 
compensation in native tokens and then it's volatile and, and we've heard stories of a, a huge drawdown in the native token like 80 percent and uh, you realize after six months of contributing to a DAO that you just have 10 percent of what what you were actually promised and and that's kind of a problem right you you're, you're not actually um encouraging anybody from the outside to come and come and contribute in a DAO which is kind of you know not the promised land so we want to build a more fair and equitable, um, you know, uh, opportunity for all the contributors, um, and you know, decide on the on the product so far that we have built is is around that. So we'll be building more primitive tooling to justify uh, a fair and equitable compensation. Yeah, and that's super interesting. We've seen a lot of like tooling that has come around for DAOs, but you know, thinking about the contributors that essentially make this DAO, how can we better provide tooling for them? And I think it becomes a challenge when you are contributing, not, you know, when you're contributing to a single DAO, that's still manageable. I think you can still figure out what your payments look like, um, what work you're doing. But the minute you start contributing to multiple DAOs, that's when it doesn't really scale managing all of that on your own with spreadsheets. Um, and that's where, you know, tooling like this is super valuable. Um, I think one last question I want to ask before, I don't know if you have any audience questions that we want to take, but um, I think generally speaking, compensation in the traditional sense goes beyond just salary and payroll. There's a lot of other things that are, you know, considered when we talk about compensation, um, benefits specifically to, you know, health, um, our retirement funds, 401k, um, but also like equity and investing of equity and investing of tokens in the crypto. Um, have you seen, you know, tooling around these like other benefits um, in, in the DAO space or are we are still too early? Go ahead, Anubhav. Okay, uh, cool. Um, yeah, so we have not seen much. Uh, we have few uh, primitive tooling that might have come out, you know, uh, but it's it's not really uh, adopted. Like there's no incentive mechanisms right now for contributors, right? Largely, like 99% of the DAOs don't have any any kind of incentive mechanisms for, for any contributors, be it core contributors. Um, and that's kind of a problem, right? Um, what that does essentially is, is that um, you um, kind of discourage a lot of people coming from Web2 to uh, contribute to Web3 because it's, it's not really uh, desirable to have, uh, you know, to not have all the benefits that, that you're usually very, um, you know, um, able to get very easily, right? Um, and, and so, you know, we're, we at Parcel are very excited about building primitive tooling on-chain um, as opposed to, you know, doing health benefits um, and and all of this, you know, building building like X for Y in, in terms of health, uh, you know, benefits that could be offered. I think there could be a lot more built um, in the primitive tooling. Um, so vesting is is you know just one one of the primitive tooling, right? So there could be multiple types of uh, vesting, in fact, that we could offer, right? So there's a lot of chatters about what kind of vesting is is kind of correct for contributors, uh, and that could only happen in Web three, right? So you you can actually make uh, different kind of autonomous trustless vesting, uh, which is which can't be done in 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 the traditional sense. So that's what we're excited about. Yeah, yeah I think. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I think vesting is definitely a problem that uh, can be solved uh, much easier than the rest in the Web three world, um, and in a way that is much better than Web two. Um, it, it, it's interesting. I think the way I think about it, benefits for uh, one ks and uh, and whatnot. Um, there's not many tools out there to help you do that right now. It's a bit complicated depending on whether you're a compliant DAO or not, like you have an LLC, right? Um, and even then, there's not really any one provider that a tool like Utopia can integrate or or we can even build. Um, we've explored ways to kind of help DAOs um, potentially have benefits, um, but it's still very early on in that space. Um, and it's really just a problem space that everyone's really exploring right now. Um, I think what Anubhav said about incentive mechanisms is quite interesting. The way I see it is that there's a there's a t um, there's a demand for talent for a lot of crypto companies, right? It's incredibly hard to hire people right now. Um, you're really trying to compete uh, as each individual company to find the best talent. 
I don't see that kind of um, race when it comes to DAOs. Like I don't, DAOs don't seem like they're competing against each other for talent, right? Um, and maybe because it's, it's still quite early in the industry, maybe they're maybe they're not having any problems at all. But when it co- but benefits and 401ks are um, an incentive for DAOs to push to their contributors to get you to work for them, right? To work for this DAO. Um, no one does it yet, and it doesn't seem like it's a competitive landscape. But really, once those incentive mechanisms are in place, um, I think we'll see a lot more innovation at that front, and it will be a tremendous value for any DAO to um, to adopt it. At, um, as it will be a great way to get talent. But um, I, I think it's an interesting observation uh, that I don't really know the, uh, the reason why. So it might be worth digging into if you're looking for uh, building your next company or looking into a problem. Yeah, I mean, that's good advice. I think this is a hackathon where builders and hackers are listening. So um, I'm just curious, you know, one thing you mentioned, and we only have a couple of minutes here, um, is this concept that DAOs are not struggling to attract talent. And a lot of people are kind of wanting to rather contribute to DAOs, regardless of you know, these compensation structures being uh, primitive. Um, yeah, what do you think, why, why do you think that that is, uh, even if it's hypothesis? Um, and I think there's a dif- distinction here between contribution for like a couple hours versus working even part-time or full-time. Um, but yeah, curious if both of you have any thoughts on why this is. Yes, and you can. Yeah, um, I mean, it's purely a hypothesis. Um, I, I don't even know if that statement is true. Um, it's, yeah, I think it's, I, I've observed that it could be. Um, and, uh, and I think there's a couple of reasons. Um, I think the novelty of working for a DAO is, um, I, I think not a lot of people, first of all, know what a DAO is and know how to work for one, right? So there's a huge education problem first. Like, it's not easy to just put up something on AngelList and say work for like Olympus DAO, because how does that really make sense? Or work for Rari. Um, it, it's a bit confusing. Generally, the people that are going to work for these DAOs already know that they want to work for them, right? So they already have DAOs in mind. They kind of are deep in the crypto rabbit hole and they um, already know kind of what companies they want to work for. Um, then really, it's just about how cool is your product, right? Um, so I think DAOs are really good at um, attracting the people that they want to attract their niche, right? Um, and early on as they're building, um, it, they, it, it doesn't seem like there's competition between um, multiple DAOs because they kind of get different subsets of their demographic, right? They get the people that are really into, into their unique products. Um, I think when we have a lot of competing DAOs, DAOs that are very similar, right? Then, then things will change, right? Because we have a lot of companies that are quite similar and yeah, then you're competing for talent. It, just broadly, like, engineers want to work on lots of technical problems. So you, there's so many, when you're, when you're trying to hire engineers, it, it becomes an incre- um, a, a, a huge challenge. And shout out, shout out to Price, one of my co-founders, that he deals with this challenge all the time. Um, but DAOs, they're very unique across each other. And so they're, they're, w- without those similarities, um, competition isn't there yet. Um, I think, yeah, yeah that, think, that, that's how I see it. Sorry. Yeah, maybe my two cents there. One is, uh, with DAOs, you are really trying to find, you're building these communities that are mission aligned, right? You really believe in what the DAO is building and you want to contribute to it, regardless of whether, you know, how the compensation looks like. So that's one. And I think what I've seen across the DAO spectrum is they are really great onboarding tools for new people to crypto. Like to start, you know, getting your hands dirty by contributing to a DAO is, is a thing. And I think that's why, we, you know, when we are seeing this like huge wave of adoption and new folks coming into this space, we are seeing a lot of people excited to start contributing to DAOs. But I think it's, beyond you know this initial onboarding stage when we reach maturity it's about how can we retain that talent and how can we keep them further engaged and what incentive structures can we build to really get the doubt to the next level um but yeah thank you both i think that's that's a great note to end and karthik's here to let us know that our time is over today uh well i came here first to say this was an amazing chat but it just happens to be that we're also at time. Um, so, well, thank you so much, Jason and Anubhav, uh, for those amazing answers and Monsi for moderating. 
Um, this was a really good discussion. I feel like we need to have another one where we just talk about all the complaints we get for working at DAOs and how do we solve them from all the tools that all of us are building. So uh, thanks, thanks again. Thanks for having us. Uh, with that, we are ready for our next panel. So the next one is a talk I'm super excited about. We want to talk about everything that's happening with memberships and NFTs and how we can make working with DAOs or just make memberships more collaborative, open, and just rethink a lot of that. So for this talk, we have Brian Flynn from Rabbit Hole, Mike Dudas from LinksDAO, and moderating this will be Julian from Unlock Protocol. And uh, I'll just welcome all of them here on stage. And uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll let you all take it from here. Great to see all of you. Hello, friends. Hello, everyone. Hey, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Julian. I'm the CEO and founder at Unlock Protocol, a protocol for membership that uses NFT. So that panel is pretty much on topic for me. Uh, maybe we'll start with a quick intro as well from Mike and Brian. Which one of you two guys want to take it first? Uh, Mike, you got it first. I'll come after. All right. Hey, Mike Dudas. Um, so uh, I do two things professionally right now. I'm an early stage Web3 investor, but you know, investing in you know, play-to-earn gaming, metaverse companies, Web3 networks, DAOs, and then tooling and infrastructure to support them. Uh, and in addition, uh, was a co-founder. I'm working on a project called LinksDAO, which is a uh, membership created golf and leisure club that I'm sure we'll talk about on today's panel. So investing and building at the same time. Brian, oh, your uh, turn. Uh, I'm Brian. I'm the CEO and founder of Rabbit Hole. Um, we do Web3 onboarding. So help people learn across DeFi, DAOs, and NFTs with applied learnings. Um, and right now we're working on on-chain credentials, which is kind of relevant to this conversation. So how can we actually use credential gating as opposed to token gating um, based on things that you've done on-chain? So excited to kind of talk about this deeper in the panel. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you guys for, for being here today. Uh, maybe let's start with a, a, pretty, a pretty, I mean, we all know what an NFT is, right? It's a profile picture on Twitter, correct? Usually a monkey, yes. Yeah, usually a monkey, <laughs> right? Uh, but so, so why why are we using NFTs for something else? What what's the why are you using NFTs for credential, Brian? Yeah, I, I think is the most of the way is that NFTs are are sort of a standard across the space, right? So, um, you know, fam famously, uh, NFTs first started as you know blockchain game assets versus the CryptoKitties use case, and then as it became more standardized across the space, you start seeing. ENS themes becoming ERC 721. You started seeing you know, tickets becoming ERC 21. Of course, access keys as ERC 21s. Um, so there's all these different use cases sort of emerging at the same time. And so because it's sort of interoperable in many different protocols, it's easy to become sterilized as these different use cases emerge. So NFTs sort of represent these digital assets in a way that can be programmed in many different ways. That makes sense. Yeah, and they can hold, you know, obviously richer data than a you know fungible token and so obviously in the context of of DAOs and other you know, web3 projects uh you know an nft you know, gives you more sort of flexibility and power in terms of how it can be used by the holders uh versus a fungible token 100% uh one thing that i would add also is that the idea that an nft is non-fungible is actually more natural like even a lot of the fungible things that we can think of like currencies eventually turn to be sometimes non-fungible like uh, bitcoin tainted coins the one that are used for scams for example are very much non-fungible you can try to bring them back on coinbase and you're gonna you're gonna see how how fungible they are or non-fungible they are uh, so i do think that in practice when we think about nfts as just monkeys we're we're seeing the the tip of the iceberg or, or the tip of the monkey, I guess, uh, which is which is not the, the best part of it. Um, but anyway, cool. So, um, Mike, what's uh, other examples? So you mentioned the Links DAO, uh, obviously golf courses in Leisure Club. Do you want to tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so I'll just so basically the concept. So, you know, basically the the preamble would be that so the term or the acronym DAO uh, by definition stands for decentralized autonomous organization uh the reality of what you know including linksdow the majority of um organizations that use the the word dow in their name or, or brand as such are not you know truly decentralized from the get-go uh nor you know are they autonomous um and you know in not fact, very organized not very organized either uh, yeah, I would say probably you know, more chaotically organized than a traditional organization. Um, but uh, I would argue 
that that's okay and and that the that it's more about the air quotes DAO and I, and I'd love I can't wait to actually debate this with Brian but you know the air quotes DAO aspect of of what uh, again you know NFTs and so so basically links DAO what links DAO is and I'll use this as an example to describe what an air quotes DAO is so basically we are a um, global community project uh, where the promise is we are going to buy a golf course uh, and that golf that, that's the first objective and that it will be community governed anybody can join from anywhere in the world we would love by the way for it to be community owned but because we did a fundraise of nfts you know without kyc um, we cannot give folks ownership of the ultimate asset or it would be an unregistered security sale so effectively what we've done um, via LinksDAO is we were able to raise money from folks anywhere in the world for a common objective, similar to Constitution DAO, where, you know, which was an inspiration. And then um, via ownership of the NFT, folks have the ability to govern. So in other words, they can vote on proposals about what this golf and leisure club should look like. Membership rules, location, you know, architect, how the money in the treasury that we raise should be spent, things of that nature. So they have some power. Now they don't have a legal right, however. They're basically an advisory board that um, a separate entity, LinkStow Corporation, listens to. So it's effectively like having an advisory board. And by the way, if we don't listen to them, and this is very similar to how Board Ape Yacht Club worked, the entire thing falls apart, okay? Because they don't have trust in us as, you know, the team behind the project to deliver what they want. So, you know, there's sort of this symbiotic relationship between the two and the NFTs give people the ability to vote and then the ability to purchase a membership in this club. So, um, it, so it's it kind of one... halfway between web two and web three, but it's not truly a DAO. And so is it, is it basically one NFT, one vote? Is that what you're describing here? Yeah, there's two classes of NFTs. One has okay. one NFT, four votes, and this is the beauty of NFTs. They can hold metadata and they're, you know, basically more robust than a fungible token. Mm -hmm. um, the others have one one vote, you know, per per holder. Okay. Um, so, you know, the goal of, our, of what we're doing is we're saying, hey, true DAOs are imperfect today and, and frankly not realistic for achieving very complex things that require great organization, particularly when there's a real world component. We're going to sort of straddle the web two world and the web three world. That and you know, there's valid criticisms of that, but that's kind of the approach we've taken to bring sort of new people in the space, try to educate them and get them involved, vote on chain and do exciting stuff like that. Okay, that makes sense. Brian, I want to give, give it a little bit of description as well as what you call uh, credentials uh, as NFTs. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, sure. So very simply, there's there are kind of two types of on-chain credentials. There's soul-bound NFTs, actually non transferable NFTs, and there's verifiable credentials, which are uh, about de using DIDs or decentralized identity uh, to have cross-chain credentials that can potentially be either off-chain or on-chain. So in our specific case, we're using soul-bound NFTs. Um, and really what that does is saying um, it takes a bunch of input data. So in our case, a bunch of on-chain transactions of saying, hey, you've done these three different DeFi interactions, so whether it's, you know, swap on Uniswap, um, lend on Aave, um, you know, maybe create a urine strategy, um, and say our output is this on-chain credential that represents that you have sufficient knowledge of DeFi. Okay. Um, and so that DeFi credential then gives you access to either different, um, you know, treasury DAOs that are looking to train, train treasury managers or different smart contracts that are looking to see if you have an understanding of risk in some capacity. Um, and so that's a lot of what we do is issuing these credentials when people getting into the space and then working with partners to find these integration partners. So let me ask you a question. If it's on chain, why even print, I mean, create the NFT, right? I, I guess if it's on chain, I could just verify that you indeed, you know, purchased the thing, uh, swapped on Uniswap or, or created a strategy. Why, why do you have to create another layer uh, in, the, in that NFT format, I guess? Yeah, so it's good for a standardization perspective, right? Okay. Saying yeah. this is the understanding context of what it means to be certified that you have this understanding of knowledge that is then common throughout all the different Web3 space. That makes a, a ton of sense. And I, that also means that you could later easily add more criteria, uh, whatever is like you've bored on compound and you add this. Uh, and so without actually changing the certification process. Let's actually yep. go one further. You said sold bound. That, that in my mind, that means that they're not transferable. Is that correct? Yep. So 
uh, Mike, what's your take on that? Like, uh, are the links that are membership transferable? Uh, what, what happens? Like, for credential, it makes pretty obvious that transferring it wouldn't make sense because uh, there's no guarantee that the person on the other side actually did go through a certification. But for the links, though, are these NFT transferable? Yeah. So it's um, so I love what Brian's doing. We're, we're small investors in Rabbit Hole and very, very fortunate to, to be so. And to your question, I mean, it, it's obviously genius and, and people identify, you know, with the NFT and the credential and the badge, it's just easier. We need to be able to translate what's happening on chain into a form that people understand. And, and Rabbit Hole is doing that brilliantly. Um, with the uh, NFTs that we have sold and that members own, um, the idea is that they have to be transferable um, because ultimately the, uh, you know, people, this is a club, you know, people, so we believe for, for you know, the club and, and, and in sort of this, you know, anyone in the world can join um, concept, you know, people may want to freely leave, freely join, um, you know, if they're non-transferable and there's you know, no market or ability for people to leave and come and leave as they wish, um, it's, it's extremely limiting. Um, and, you know, so I'll give you an example. Like, we think this is an improvement on existing membership models. If you want to join a golf club, you know, in many uh, places today, you know, the initiation fees are literally in the $50,000 plus range, some into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, not accessible to people, and you lose the money. It's money out the door. We believe this is an improvement where, hey, I may want to, you know, purchase the NFT. That's my initiation fee. Then I join the club for a year or two. When I'm done, I can then you know, sell that to somebody else. So there's enduring value. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, that's a novel model that really hasn't existed before. Um, and so you know, we believe that if you don't have those transfer rights, um, one, it makes it you know, certainly a less attractive um, model to folks. And, uh, and frankly, you know, we think less valuable in the long run. Uh, from Mike, a Mike, I have a quick question for you on that. Is there a secondary market right now for memberships or how does liquidity look like? Yeah, so we don't encourage it. In other words, like our goal here, um, and, and people ask us, for example, the price of, you know, LinkStow NFTs, like you'll never see me talking about this, you know, publicly. The goal here is not, you know, price appreciation through talking about it. So yes, there's a secondary market. We don't link to it from our, um, you know, Twitter, from our website, our goal is not to have people resell these. And right. frankly, we have, I think, fewer than 200 out of now 9,090 listed and, and we're delighted. And we have 5,300 unique holders. We actually want that to raise. We want it to be as close to one-to-one -one as possible. Um, that's the mission. You know what I mean? Um, this isn't like a, you know, a PFP project where we want people flipping and you know, make tons of money on, on secondary royalties. I think that's where the membership model moves. And as we start to get things you know, like this pool suite club and these different membership clubs, but the onus is on us to deliver value. And yeah. our members don't, you know, they're, they're, they're on us every day. If we try to do things that are non-core that don't tie to delivering a golf course, these people aren't here. This is what's cool about these membership and utility-based NFTs. You know, they're not here for the flashy stuff. And if you're in our Discord, they complain like heck if we're spending money that's not targeted on what they believe that they purchased. So what's interesting here, uh, just to rephrase what you both said, is like basically NFTs, as you said, like if you think about the profile picture on Twitter, kind of pointless. Uh, but here you have two types of NFTs, one that are transferable, the one that, that Mike does for the DAO or the Links DAO, and then some that are not transferable, some that are purchasable. I assume the NFTs from the Links DAO were purchasable. The credential, I hope they're not purchasable. I cannot show up with a ton of money and say, hey, give me the credential, even though I've never done these things. So we already have a distinction here. There's another uh, kind of interesting aspect. Some NFTs have expiration dates, and that's specifically the case for Unlock. Is that one of these two? I mean, and, and the purpose here is obviously to say a certification might be just time limited. If you're thinking about like, you know, uh, uh, a doctor, you need to, uh, you know, get relicensed every two years or every five years, or even a, drive, a driver license. Like it's a certification that I can drive the car. You have to renew every five years. Is that something that you guys are doing, Brian? Like, so I'll go like quick because I think Brian's answer will be longer. So in our case, what we will offer to folks is a very low priced, highly accessible perks pass. Uh -huh. um, that will expire. I believe there's a new you know, Ethereum token standard that will allow for sort of expiring tokens on a certain time duration. So we'll offer those for sale. They'll expire after 12 months. You can then repurchase. Um, and that perks pass gives you those benefits for that period Absolutely. of time. Yep. Okay. And then I think so Brian because the one because the one the one though that you have in the links though are forever. It's like it's a it's a it's a exactly key, they're the Genesis passes that, that give uh, you membership. Golden yep. key. Okay. Cool. Brian, uh, time bound. Yeah. 
So in our case, um, you know, similar to how a lawyer needs to upkeep their credential every so year, yes. number of years, Another good example, yeah. uh, we need to upkeep our DeFi and our team DAO credentials every few months, right? So the, the content underneath the credential is going to change periodically. And then that is then voted upon by the community. So say a protocol gets upgraded from V2 to V3, which just happened with Aave, or say there's a new protocol that teaches some underlying skill better, um, there is a need to kind of rotate out the underlying content or on-chain tasks that are associated with the credential. Um, and so every so often you'll need to get a new credential that presents that you know the latest knowledge. Um, and is that, is that sort of what's is that happening. A new one? Can I lose my old one? Is it technically like, is it taken from my wallet if I basically don't have the... the it, it, it's a new one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So basically yeah. I have the first certification and then, okay, no, now you've got the V2 yeah. certification that includes av 3 Okay. That's very good. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about blockchains. Uh, obviously, um, most NFTs are inside of the, let's say, Ethereum ecosystem, or EVM ecosystem, even though most of them are on, on, on mainnet. Is that the case for both of your stuff? Or are you guys considering other blockchains, other EVM ecosystems? Yeah. Uh, yeah, our, ours is just Ethereum because we believe that for credits to be valuable, they need to be on the most decentralized chain, Ethereum. Okay. okay. What about the Lynx DAO? Yeah, and so ours, you know, was much more more of a capitalistic. Hey, we need the funds to actually okay. achieve what we're going after, and and the money is on Ethereum. We didn't feel like we could raise the money necessary to accomplish our objective if we had done it on a different chain in January of yeah this year. You know, just we didn't think the money was there on Solana and Avalanche and others to do a raise that was as successful as ours was. Okay, but I guess thinking about the future, when you said you're you're going to have this uh, kind of first pass. First yeah. pass, is that is that something that you would consider at that point? It's like, okay, cool. We, we would. So if okay. if the fees are in the rate, like, so let's just say that the perks pass is $100, $150, um, you know, chain, you know, the, the uh, sorry, purchase, and the, the consumer base who's purchasing it, perhaps, you know, they're not concerned, like these aren't because you're doing on-chain activities and things of that nature. If the pass, let's just say is 150 bucks and it would cost, you know, 15 to $30 to mint it, on Does Ethereum, that would be a yeah. difficult decision. We'd have yeah. to look at Polygon. Um, but other, you know, other than that, you know, my my preference would be to continue to keep all of these issues on you know, Ethereum. That makes sense. Cool. Uh, maybe another question, which I think is uh, a fun one uh, around privacy. So I guess in the context of credentials, there's no such thing as privacy. Like, I mean, I, I want people to know that I'm certified. What are you thinking about this in the in the Links DAO? Like, do I really want everyone uh, to know that I'm a member of the Links DAO? I mean, or is, is yeah, there, it's yeah. a great question. So uh, the the it, it's pretty challenging. And it, so one thing I actually joke tweeted about it, you know, the other day was I did the Michael Jordan meme where I was like, you know, somebody voted against my DAO proposal, and I took it personally. But the point is, like, you can basically see the addresses and how they're voting on different proposals. Um, yeah, I don't think that's an ideal situation. So we're obviously gonna have to move to like ZK rollups for how these votes are conducted. So the people can't, I don't, I don't think in the long run, it's really good to see how individuals voted on, um, you know, very, very personal issues that relate to money and participation. Um, so yeah, the other option is, Hey, you look to an entirely different chain, you know, something like secret that is privacy by default NFTs. Um, you know, but, but for now, I think, uh, it's a problem that, you know, how people vote on every single thing is visible to everybody by default. Absolutely. That makes a ton of sense. Uh, Brian, a point on privacy. Yeah. In, in our case, um, it's definitely an issue that you can see holdings and assets of a user along with their credentials. In an ideal case, you would just see credentials and not and kind of shield wall balances. So uh, I think definitely in the future, we're looking towards moving towards more of a zero knowledge system where you can just um, show attestations that you've done specific things on chain without revealing uh, your, your address, address, your private key. Or yeah, exactly. Um, so I think the technology is, is still sort of evolving um, on that front. Um, there's also, it's sort of interesting how DIDs can solve something very similar where you could just have the DID reveal certain um, private information around certain user without also revealing the, the addresses itself. So I guess there'll be a few implementations, but I guess we'll have to see how that kind of evolves. That makes sense. Maybe uh, another opening question, like thinking about uh, the NFT space. So uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but I still use MetaMask in my, in my, my red browser. I think uh, 30 million of us do. MetaMask still doesn't have like native support for NFTs on, 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 on the extension. What are we missing in the space to make NFTs much easier to use uh, by, you know, normals, normies, as they say? One of you want to take that on? 
Maybe Brian. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think in terms of like making NFTs easier to use, I don't think it comes down to the wallet. So I think it actually comes down to utility use cases themselves, okay. right? Like I don't think it's up to the wallets to decide like how these NFTs become used. I've seen some different, um, I've seen some projects working on sort of being able to aggregate action items of NFTs. So if there's, you know, there's like eight different use cases of one specific NFT, whether it's, you know, nouns or board apes or something, because they're um, infinitely programmable, you're able to kind of aggregate those all in one place. Um, it sort of remains to be seen how easy it is to kind of curate and query the information to kind of create those different user experiences. But I think once we have something like that, it would be as simple as, you know, based off the NFTs you have in your wallet, here's the 15 different things you can start doing with it. Um, and it might take a while to get there, but I think that ends up being the end state. Okay, yeah, and the sense. two things that I would say, one would be uh, you know, sort of delegation to your own wallets of the capabilities of the NFTs that you don't want to have interacting with smart contracts on a regular basis. Uh -huh. You know, I don't want to, like my, you know, I don't want to have to, every time I do a Lynx DAO vote, basically, you know, put my entire wallet at risk. So that makes it complex and you have to put, your assets in different places. We need to solve that. Um, for so sure. basically, just to clarify for people, you would own technically own the NFT on a on a hardware key or something very highly secure, and yet have delegated the rights associated with owning, owning that NFT to some hot wallet that allows you to kind of vote or do things like this. Is that exactly, right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. I will have signed and delegated to that wallet that you know, theoretically I own, or if I want to delegate to somebody yeah. else. Okay. And then another would be you know just getting it getting it to a point where it's easy enough to get from centralized exchanges to MetaMask or other wallets in you know, less than five days. So people can actually purchase and interact with the thing. So that the cryptocurrency is more than the NFT itself, like allow yeah. people to easily go on board. Okay. Yep. So if, yep. one thing that we do at Unlock, I'm going I'm to shill Unlock here a little bit, obviously, is that we have credit card support. So we allow people to purchase uh, NFT memberships with credit cards. Uh, we did this actually for ICC in Paris, the conference that's selling their tickets through uh, Unlock as, as tickets. And one of the cool things that we did also do you think is actually a, a good question to for, for you guys as well? Like, uh, there's been a bunch of people that are trying to buy tickets uh, and we sell them on secondary markets. And we mentioned secondary markets earlier. We had to build in into to build uh, sorry in the contract to build in the uh, concept of a captcha to make sure that bots are not able to buy uh, tickets at scale, in scale and then resell them, which is kind of a, a painful thing and some some of the stuff that we're pretty proud of. Cool. Yep. And um, then I think two other things would just be more easily readable signature messages. Yeah. And, you know, it's really even challenging for me. And then messaging. I love what like other scans starting to do. Yes. You know, disclosure, it's a portfolio company, but, you know, with wallet to wallet messaging, XMTP, like there's some interesting things happening in terms of wallet to wallet messaging that will make it easier and more fluid for people to uh, use their NFTs and communicate with one another. Absolutely. That makes a ton of sense. Uh, so these are all very good points about NFTs. What are memberships, or is there any membership in the, you know, in the in the, in the physical world, I say, or in the pre-NFT world that shouldn't be an NFT? Is there one at least that you can think of, like, no, 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 this would be a bad idea to be an NFT? Can, can you think of one, or no, they should all be NFTs? Yeah, I mean, for for membership specifically, when it comes down to um, the individuals' individuals' talent or ability. Uh, those are the things that shouldn't be NFTs because it doesn't matter about you know, sort of their their net worth as a case, but more so them as an individual. Um, Mike, actually, you might have some thoughts on this. But I'd be curious how you know in, in some uh, membership clubs they do a bunch of interviews, you know, to, to figure out what type of person you are if you kind of yes, for exclusive ones, um, yeah. especially very exclusive ones. Yeah. So, like, how would in, in Link style case, if you just buy a membership to be part of it? Like, is there usually that kind of bypasses the interview process? So, yeah, so we are really, yeah, so um, I think we've punted like down the road some of the complexity of what you're talking about with real world memberships. Like, you know, in a utopian world and the way that we've presented it, anybody has access, but clearly before you join uh, a Link style physical club, there has to be an element of doxing of to some extent and, and safety is 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 paramount we can't have like you know criminals like walking around the golf course so we definitely have some dicey things that we're going to be working through over the next nine months before the club opens so um yeah i would think that you know things that involve to your point like background checks are essential you know like uh, but couldn't these yeah. be nfts as well like in some way i mean i know there's a ton of companies that oh for sure we're just not NFTs. there yet yeah exactly. yeah, yeah, so yeah. like if, if you like, could, like, 
Yeah, I'd yeah. love like the, you know, clean background check credential and that should be easily done. And, you know, the great credit score credential yeah. like, that could be easily done, but it, yeah, it just hasn't happened yet. And the benefit of this is like, now it becomes composable. You can actually easily say, hey, my, my Lings DAO NFT is only working if I am, you know, uh, wearing a tux and the wearing a tux is an NFT itself uh, in yeah. some way. Yeah. And so anyway, like I would say, you know, there's no rush, like to the original question to turn traditional membership clubs and nft clubs like let's be honest like even us like we haven't bought the golf course yet like nobody's actually delivered on the utility that we're promising i feel like there's some really i mean i would say fwb has they've been around mm. longer they've had great events they're I'll tell you, so, sorry like, i don't if, yeah if cc has using i mean tickets as nfts as memberships that's the thing right like you at some point could yeah. unlock four Although they've been harder like, like some of these nft tickets like i couldn't even figure out how to get into uh, the damn thing so it's, you know it's a, a lot fun, of this yeah. stuff doesn't work yet <laughs> yeah but i mean it doesn't work for everyone for sure but it does work in practice like that's been delivered like it's not you know when yeah. you say the golf course isn't bought like yes but the tickets to the conference the conference did happen and was there right so right, like, right 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 there have been bad executions of it's still it's, still it's still it's still uh it's still tricky and, and 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 not as clean as it could be but yes for sure it's it's some of them actually already exist and i mean brian's credential are real like it's not like there's no you know um it's not it's it's real i guess can we uh, touch on the token gating element of FWB? Uh, was, I think it was an interesting um, debate we had whether the token gating aspect of fungible tokens versus NFT gating yes. NFTs make more sense. Um, Mike, I mean, you probably have a lot of thoughts on this. And yeah, this so well. I mean, the token gating one is really, so a couple things. One, token governance is difficult because it separates the actual NFT holder from the you know token holder. Could you just be a trader or a whale? Um, the challenge with fungible token gating to events is that, you know, the price is really volatile and rise. Like it just, it's, it's not perfect. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of problems that haven't been solved with, um, you know, event-based and membership-based fungible token gating. Um, so, you know, I, I, that's why we chose not to do it at this point, frankly. And I mean, these problems actually existed in people's world. Like if you go to a very popular concert, the tickets are all being sold in five minutes, whether they're NFT or not. Uh, you have the same problem with scalpers that are, you know, buying them and selling them at the door. It's, it's, these problems are, are not, uh, what we, were not invented by NFTs. I think one of the things that a lot of criticism that happened in the NFT space right now are problems that existed before that are just obvious with NFTs uh, and maybe actually have a better way of being solved in that scenario. It feels like uh, the scalpers issue on tickets is something that has existed for like, you know, as long as tickets have existed at this point. Uh, and, and with NFTs, we actually have ways to say, hey, using linking credentials, like, hey, okay, you want to buy the ticket to, uh, you know, uh, uh, whoever is the latest singer of the moment. Uh, you can only do that if you have their NFT to, their, to unlock their music over the last six months. And so that's a way to ensure that only fans are actually buying the tickets and yep. not just uh, rendos, basically. So I think the big things that shouldn't exist, like a traditional fan club where I'm just putting a little bit, like, so So the problem with selling NFTs for memberships is that they're forever, right? And I just think you're going to see a lot of people, in most cases, today, the promise is you're buying the thing, it's forever. Some, you're, you know, you've paid X and someday somebody else it's transferable to. We talked about the fact that we'll have, you know, yeah. subscription-based and perishable. Yourself, yeah, yeah. But like today, I think there's a lot of people issuing NFTs for their metaverse world and their this and that who do not realize the obligation of like, look, I'm going to have this fan base that, you know, in this community that put money in that's going to just expect literal, that they're owners and not just customers, but like owners that expect yep. delivery of some service forever. A lot of people are going to run into trouble with that in my mind over the next couple of years. A hundred percent. I think that's one of the big challenges around NFTs is like a lot of the misconception and kind of the, the implicit lies, I'd say, of stuff that was, hey, this is the way it works. Like eh, in practice, I mean, I'm sure these things 10 years from now, most of them will actually not honor or any of the thing that they said they would do or any of these roadmaps in that scenario. Yeah. And I think it's, cool. it'll be interesting to see how do you, how do you basically delineate a rug from something that just sort of ran its course and people got the value. And I don't think people's minds are aligned against the thing that these are, you know, maybe some of them are depreciating, you know, depreciating absolutely. things. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So we have a, a few minutes left. Uh, Brian, wanna, oh, maybe not even that. I see Kartik. One of the Kartiks is coming. Uh, Brian. I think Kartik wants hot takes here. <laughs> Yeah. I, I mean, I, I would have loved to get more hotter takes. Um, I guess my, my only question would just be, uh, obviously, there's a couple of themes here, which is, uh, I think this topic here itself is covering 
in a way the the blend of Web two and Web three side of experiences. Like we know how memberships work. We know like what my credit card perks look like, and I know I have different tiers based on what access I can get. So I guess I'm, what I'm curious about is um, from all the anywhere from comments or feedback you've gotten from uh, your members or just uh, things that you see have the potential of kind of getting uh, better is is kind of the output here like a better way to think about memberships or is the output here that now we can just make it more free and open and make it more composable? Like I'd love to be able to say, hey, if you were part of these other memberships, you can now get access to this or priority access to something else. Like, is that how you think about how you feel like memberships will evolve or um, we need you know, a whole new different way? I definitely agree with that. I think the free and openness and the programmability in some way. I think both of you alluded to this earlier is the idea that, hey, if I know that a membership exists, I can leverage it even if I have nothing to do with it, basically. So yes, I can give access to some content to my on my site because they are certified by by, by Rabbit Hole uh, without actually asking Rabbit Hole's permission to do that. Or I can give access to my ski club to the people of the LinksDAO without any agreement with the LinksDAO people. And so to me, that's exactly. actually a very powerful thing that... Uh, we're going to be able to see more and more of that actually exists in the real world. Like think of the AAA membership. Uh, I, I re recently learned that most restaurants that offer, offer AAA discounts actually have nothing to do with AAA. Uh, uh, really uh, a poor version of that would like you get to transfer air miles with a massive hit on the actual output, but yes. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's kind of interesting that permissionless and that decentralization in, in, in that world enables a lot of different new patterns and use cases that I think we're going to see emerge. Uh, I mean, we've already started to see emerge uh, to Mike's point, in a in a in a say in a rough way, I'd say, but um, that's coming and that's pretty exciting to see. Yeah, I would just say traditional, like typical, like partnerships you work in, they're harder to execute in a DAO environment for us because, like, how do you coordinate all these people? Who approves this stuff? Like, it's really freaking hard. Um, and you're so focused on just reining in and managing and making decisions together. So I think right now we're not that composable phase. So you know, I think to Julian's point, it's like, yo if somebody wants to airdrop stuff to our holders or do partnerships and offer them, you know, go do it. It's just, it, we're not going to say no, but it's hard for us you to can't. get involved and do it. I mean, practically you can't say no. That's actually the best part of exactly. it. Exactly. There's no, exactly. Just like, uh, <laughs> want to give a, a final little shout to all of these people here uh, at the bottom of my screen. These are my members. I've got my own little membership. Uh, if you join my blog, it's $5 a year. Don't need to buy. You can just go on the blog and, and see how you can earn it. Uh, but I actually bring them with me on every single of my calls. And so they were here. These are all of the little icons that are there. I think one of you might be in there. I don't know. What, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> who, but yeah. Amazing. All right. Well, thank you all. Really appreciate the time. Thank Thanks for the invite, card. Brian, thank you so much. And Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank all right. With that, we are ready for our next talk. And this one is all about governance and participation. Of course, this is a whole event around how do we make it easy for us to uh, contribute to and manage DAOs at different scales. So there's a lot of people working on toolings for the hackathon, but there's a lot of other aspects to this thing, whether they're social or, or purely technical. And we're going to have an amazing chat about all these things here. So with that, I want to welcome Evan, Will, Kaido, and Dan to kind of take over here. And Dan will be the one moderating this thing. So I'll let Dan uh, introduce himself and then um, get us started with the rest of our speakers. So welcome. Hello, welcome, welcome. All right. Um, Excited for the chat today. Can everyone hear me? Mic check, yep. good. We're all good. So quick intros. Um, we've got a, a great panel today. We've got Kaido, who is, he does research. He researches incentive design at Llama. Um, he does a bunch of things. I mean, tokenomics with VitaDAO and LabDAO, redelegation at Interchain, which I, I actually don't know what that means, but it sounds interesting. Um, and just like a, generally like a gigabrain writer. So Welcome, Kaido. We've got Ivan, who's um, he works at Gearbox Protocol, Composable Leverage Protocol. Welcome, Ivan. Nice to have you. And then Will, who's a founding member at Developer DAO. Um, and I am Dan. I'm a product manager at Orca Protocol. So, welcome, gents. Thank you. Great to be here. Awesome. So, the conversation today is governance and participation. We're going to chat about governance, we're going to chat about participation. Um, I would love to just start off with defining governance super quick. So I'll actually start with Will. Um, you know, what, what does governance mean to you? And maybe a little more tactically and contextually, like given your experience in developer DAO, like what, what does it mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, appreciate being here. Thanks for ETH Global and everything, um, everybody that's put this on. So 
Yeah, governance, man, what a topic, right? It's like if you search like define governance, it says like the act of governing and you're like, okay, <laughs> cool, this is this is awesome. But no, you know, the, the way I think about it is, um, you know, establishing and enforcing rules um, for protocols and or social groups to um, follow. And so really, you know, at the end of the day, it's an attempt to coordinate whether it's efforts um, or um, financial assets or, or whatever it is. Um, you know, that's, that's really how I think about governance. And um, you asked a question about developer DAO. So a little context, developer DAO is a uh, social slash service DAO um, where our goals, our mission is really to uh, enable a new wave of Web3 developers and to build public goods. And so, um, you know, really for us right now, as we're beginning to build out public goods, so much of our activity is um, social activity. And so um, with that, our, you know, the, the, the issues in governance we're having right now is how to enable activity from participation, um, get people involved, uh, build reward mechanisms and incentive mechanisms that um, incentivize the correct behavior. And so um, really kind of that's what we're focused on today. And um, I'm excited to talk more about that and then also talk more about uh, governance of existing protocols um, and and kind of the DeFi space and some of the other topics we have uh, on the agenda today. Nice, I love that. Um, so speaking of incentives, Kaido, I know you do a lot of research here. So like, where do you even begin when you think about how to incentivize contributors within DAOs to kind of drive governance forward? Like, what's a framework? that folks can use to kind of think about how to incentivize, who to incentivize, what types of actions to incentivize, like where do you start with that, Kaido? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And first of all, is, you know, hello everybody, Kaido. <laughs> and uh, I'll give my honest answer. I don't think there's a framework. Uh, we're all, mm -hmm. I think, crossing the river while trying to find where the next lending step is. Um, but I think there are a few questions you know, on incentive, which is, like we talk a lot about like incentivizing contributors. I think what what is going on on top of uh, Will's point, I think it's also responsibility uh, is also very important. I see. Um, so that means if something goes wrong, someone has to answer for it. Right. And I think this uh, lack of responsibility, it's, it's, it's also a problem, I would say. It's also sort of in the incentive design, you cannot just have positive incentive design. You also need some kind of like slashing mechanism per se. So I think uh, generally you can start with, you know, those two buckets. I think when somebody does something good and that's based on the protocol you're thinking about, something happens, right? That's on the positive incentive. A negative incentive, if something goes wrong, you know, who's there to answer, you know, something about like, no matter it's slashing it or it's like, a, do you resign these different mechanisms? So I think once you start there, then you can optimize protocol by protocol. But for example, for a DeFi, protocol then there's a lot of uh, positive incentive for example like you have to write proposals you have to do uh, risk parameter adjustments you have to study the protocols that are you know being proposed etc cetera, etc cetera. and on the negative side as well i think that's uh currently not really thought of uh at this point and for a social token project right it's it's completely different another dynamic sometimes you know these people come and go so do you want to incentivize long-term behavior or do you want to incentivize short-term behavior? How do you reflect it in your payment or even uh, messaging to the community? And those are very, also very different. Uh, just to uh, give a quick example, um, there's a very interesting uh, organizational design or incentive structure called the Orbit model. Uh, this is more on the open source side. It's not strictly to blockchain. I think basically it thinks community or community development in a linear fashion, but in this linear fashion, the size of community grew and drops, and therefore your incentive shouldn't stay flat, right? So you should adjust accordingly to this kind of um, outside forces. And how do we think about that and implement that into the into the real world would be would be very interesting. I'll leave it there. I can't go on nice. for, for too long on this. <laughs> no, we'll we'll get more spicy takes. Um, so speaking of like incentivizing people, Ivan, I know. Gearbox protocol, you guys have just gone through a process of like a whole claim and delegation process for, um, I guess, the DAO that you're starting. So could you talk a little bit about like the stage of where Gearbox protocol is and kind of why, why delegation, why now, and, and what kind of you hope to see from your delegates? <laughs> 
Yeah, so the current delegation is just the thing that was actually from the past when the DAO basically started uh, during Christmas and there were a few different stages. So the way we approached is with different user bases, essentially. Some were testers, some were active participants back when there was nothing promised, uh, of course, filtering for bots and a few other stages. And it simply happened that a couple of those, while we were busy with V2 and other actual protocol work, we didn't do it. So it's let's say this is just the why it happened now is because we didn't do it then. So it's not like, it's not part of the design per se. Part of the design was making a token non-transferable that Ribbon has done before, that Element will have now and other protocols. So making token non-transferable basically allows you to already give incentives to contributors and those who work without creating the, those early discussions, which are sometimes damaging to a community. Whereas some of the, when listening, when other kind of chats, they're not wrong to ask, it's just that when you are starting out, you don't want to have that much pollution because the more noise you have, the more quality contributors will be kind of not willing to participate in that discourse, right? Uh, so that you could call part of design. That one we've been happy with so far. Um, yep. Nice. Um, what do you hope to see from the delegates for Gearbox Protocol? And is the delegate, are there other roles that'll play um, that will kind of be active in your governance besides delegates? <laughs> Good point. So our governance is for now just snapshot. So it's off chain, nothing too fancy. Uh, let's say it's not governed alpha yet with a few groups or committees. So it's very like mellowed down for now because protocol is early enough. And that's what more pro most protocols do. It's a fine thing seems to be nowadays, especially in DeFi. Um, for now, the delegates are just that we have like a 2% total supply quorum. Whereas, of course, the DAO usually has 50%, right? So if you're talking about circulating, that's like 25% or so. Uh, so the quorum is not too low. And in case you want to push some things, let's say apathy in governance is a thing that probably will never go away anywhere. You can try to manage incentives, but it will always be like, it won't go like this, right? It will likely stay like flat and go down. So uh, it's I don't consider it cool that if you push like pro small proposals every week or so, it just governs the illusion. People constantly like, okay, what are we going to wear today? What are we going to eat for lunch? You know, this kind of thing completely kills the attention of people. Uh, so delegates are there to just make qu pushing quorum easier. Uh, and of course, those delegates are the only ones working. And if we are talking about more broadly about governance and inclusion and making everybody participate, uh, once you really look at how many people in a given DAO, whatever its sizes are working, you will always be like, let's say a small DAO within 10, right? A bigger DAO, maybe 50 at best, right? The others are just discussing and talking. So it's not that you have to optimize towards really making those people vote. It's just that the system should be open for them to enter, for them to participate. There has to be accountability, but you shouldn't like make the system, I think, where you're cramped essentially for moving forward. So it still has yeah. to be pretty, let's say, standard and uh, movable, basically, instead nice. of having too many complexities. Yeah, I'm going to keep digging with you a little more because I want to I wanna get some spice. We'll get some spice here. So for your delegates, what sort of participation do you expect from them, right? If they are supposed to represent the average token holder and kind of amplify the voices of individuals like how do you make sure that they're incentivized? How do you hold them accountable? What sort of participation participation do you expect? Because we've seen in the past that delegating in itself is not the solution. Like there's other mechanisms, right, to kind of make delegation work. So curious how you think about like making sure delegation works for you guys. Yeah, great point. So I always try to stick to a rule that in any community or let's say any workforce, there is always 90% of people just doing kind of jack shit, sorry for the word, just doing nothing and just saying blah, blah. 9% yeah. are like involved, but they are like not 24 seven, right? They do things, they're cool. They are around, they want incentives, perfectly fine. And the 1% are the devs and people who really work and don't sleep and like do work on weekends. It's a fine split. You, If you try to change it, I don't think you will really change the numbers that much, but it is important that every, every group is felt, let's say their own place in a community, right? You don't want to alle alleviate any one of them, alienate, sorry, any one of them. So for the 90%, they just have fun posting stickers, memes, discussing something, and just being generally in the community. That I think applies everywhere in Gearbox as well. Um, 9% uh, and the 1%, that's where the split is. So that's where the difference is between actually a working contributor member and the one that jumps in and out sometimes. So I would say delegates in any community, in most communities, I'm, I'm very much generalizing, so happy to hear some fighting back, you know. Uh, but let's say the 9% are the ones who would perfect role for delegates. 
because they don't do 24 seven work that they are yet they are on top of things. So that's a great group. And the 1%, I would say the devs and people who actually work. So our delegation so far showed that because that 1% is the most active in communities and delivers the most, people actually get delegate to them the most, right? Uh, in which case, without even forcing some form of a committee being responsible, people delegated to a committee. So without like putting boundaries in place, it ended up being centralized in that way, which it would have been anyway. If we made like synthetic style committees, which are like rolling or with element structure, it, it, it's more or less the same, of, of course, broadly speaking. Um, yeah, so delegates, we thought of doing some incentives for them. And then we looked at the, how many possibly delegates there could be. And as soon as you announce some incentives for delegates, even if you make it as such that they have to make some forum posts, what you're going to get, airdrop hunters are going to make dummy posts saying, I am all for the great future and things like that. So not a good idea. Um, if you say you have to participate in at least 80% of the votes, well, people are just really going to be dummy clicking on snapshot, which doesn't really result in much. Mm -hmm. So probably when incentivizing like this social positive behavior, Honestly, I think the best one I've seen wor work so far is where a core team or DAO or structure, they have like good intentions and good faith essentially. And it's a retroactive distribution after some time. So you can do periodic retroactive distribution, like for example, Optimism does. And that way you are less likely to be gamed. At least that's the one I've seen work the most so far in other DAOs as well. Again, very much generalizing. Yeah. Happy to hear what you guys disagree with. Well, yeah, I was going to say, I don't think I'm going to disagree with much um, because like you said, you know, you kind of de described the power law distribution, right, of activities where most people aren't going to contribute. And so um, the, the thing I would say is, especially for somebody who's listening that might be participating in the hackathon or something like that is um, build tools that like let us continue to experiment with these things because, um, you know, it gets back to the incentive problem, just like you said, it's difficult to incentivize exactly what we want, right? It's like, it's it's tough to say, you know, we want good delegates that act in good faith for the DAO. But then it's like, if you get pressed to define that, it gets, it gets harder to define it. And so you can't put it in rules that lead to that action being incentivized um, in a objective way. And so um, at the end of the day, we've got to continue to experiment with different things and, um, one of the things, too, that I think about a lot is from a DAO standpoint, DAO is such a generic term, and I think it's the right term to be using right now. And I think um, all of the things we're doing in the ecosystem to uh, kind of start at that base level is um, that that's where the activity should be. But um, there, there, a conflict um, arises between um, a uh, like an open standard that uh, a DAO could, you know, kind of tweak to their needs and like turnkey solutions that are very rigid. And so um, I've, I've just felt that as well, where when we've been starting the social service DAO, um, it, you know, we can't really copy and paste from a financial protocol DAO, right? Because then we end up with these incentive mechanisms that don't make any sense for a, a social DAO. And so um, I just am, am really excited about tool sets out there that um, let experimentation happen or um, focus, like vertical focus um, DAO tooling that's either you know for this vertical or for that vertical. I think that's going to help the space a lot. Nice. Could I ask a question? Well, yeah, go for oh, it. Oh, am I interrupt? Uh, speaking of the tooling, uh, what are the things actually you would recommend? I feel free to shield uh, if you invested in any, if that's allowed. I'm just curious, like what tooling you guys, since you've been in DAOs for a long time and you uh, summoned a few, what tooling have you been comfortable with? I'm just like personally not a fan of learning new platforms. So even if it helps, let's say down the line, just feel like vendor locking into something is a very big thing, but maybe I'm just being boomer about it. You know, so curious, like <laughs> what DAO tooling you have found to be helpful apart from a Discord board deleting GM messages. <laughs> Somebody want to take that first? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a... I'll spice it up. So I, I think DAO tooling, it's should start incremental stuff instead of instead of thinking about grand grand things. I think it's, it's you you build incrementally and then you reach a point of infect, inflection and then you you be, a lot of people start using it. Uh, just a quick example, like one of the most important tools right now, I think in a lot of DAOs is funny enough. You, if we forget about Discord, it's actually Collabland. Um, I would say that's the most important DAO tooling thing out there, right? It's, but it's, but it's a, such a small thing. But if without it, right, all the token gated communities, all the things you you want to uh, essentially have membership 
it's, it's all out of the window. So I think, I think for hackathons and also for like founders thinking about it, I think it's start incrementally and build these really seemingly basic ideas. And the other thing I want to point out on DAO tooling, uh, which I personally believe it's, it's not, it's less of a technical challenge, but more of a product challenge or design challenge. Because like, like, like we use Twitter, Slack, Discord, Telegram, Signal, Messenger, iMessage to chat with crypto people. It's very cumbersome uh, in this way. So we already, our mental share of like uh, understanding new apps is probably already maxed out. So how do you build easy to understand designs to incorporate different people? And right, we would talk about the power law distribution. Is there a way in the future where you could build something as simple as a Discord plugin even, even right? So that you can, you know, allow people to participate much easier and even understand the pro uh, protocol much easier or even understand the proposals much easier, understand the background of different delegates uh, easier. I mean, those are incremental steps. I think it's really wor worth exploring in, in, the, in the tooling space. Nice. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. And back to your question, just real quick, um, you know, like quarter nape is an obvious one. Um, but even then it goes to highlights, highlight the um, example of like, it, you, you need to understand how a tool is designed to be used because one of the areas that developer DAO has messed up in the beginning is running the biggest two day quarter nape circle that's ever existed. And that's not like an achievement that we're like thrilled about because there's lots of issues with that. And so, um, so yeah, I think, I think like we said, just really finding ways to, to, um, solve those basic problems like like Kato was mentioning um and without adding a ton of um technical debt or user experience debt into your DAO is something that um is is where you're like okay this is a win-win like collab land easy to set up easy to understand massive value delivered to your DAO members um as they get access into this token gated community awesome um, we are actually coming up on time, believe it or not. So I, I want to ask a question for the group and whoever has the spiciest take can go first, but what is the future of token voting within DAOs and protocols? What is the future? If there is one or not. You try since you're going to yeah, do it. Go first in the mind. Um, it probably, it could go away, but it depends on where the money will end up. So the token voting is there. If you strip away token voting into some, uh, I don't know, uh, committee NFTs, right? Or some other thing you, that means that people won't be buying the token since the value, if your token value mostly is governance, then it's essentially stripped away. And now token is also used as inflation to make the positive feedback loop, right? In many protocols, uh, even with NFT one. So. Uh, you need to add back from the supply, from the demand side. So you can't really strip that away. If you find a way to make the value appear somewhere else, uh, well, if you go back to equity and then equity goes into NFTs, you go back to the old model, but could be fine as well. Um, so it depends on how the money will flow, really. Uh, for now, uh, people complain a lot about the uh, decentralization, sorry, centralization of token voting, right? But I don't think in any semi-democratic systems, it was ever really different. If you split it not into token voting or something else, there will be just other ways to essentially control larger groups of people, even if you make it like more civil resistance somehow. So I don't see much need in it. It's more so that what is lacking is really quality participation and producing some good products, good tech and other things, um, rather than splitting it away from the control there. Because you, it's a, so far, I'd say at least the ethos we took, maybe it's slightly cynical. I'm slightly cynical. Uh, you might have caught that a bit. Uh, it's more so that I feel the system should be open and you can go to Discord chats even uh, and you can make many of them. They should be open, but it doesn't mean you have to open the chats into everybody in the contributor chats, right? But say if developers are chatting in there, everybody can see what's happening. Everybody can voice an opinion or say something is bad or something like that. But it doesn't mean they will be jumping into the same chat and sharing like, I don't know, gifts in there to like completely disturb the workforce. The same way with governance, like you can engage in token votes and like that a bit more. Um, and yeah, end of the day, even if you split the governance really well, uh, it, it's based on the ethos of the ex-core members or the current core members, because if they don't mean well, they'll probably push for some proposals which are not even that good. Uh, and 
sorry, and that's another discussion where large treasuries are essentially being used for uh, paying retainers, right? When the protocol gets to a stage when it's large enough, what's the best incentive there? Nobody knows how to go to an X anymore after that. So they secure a nice X1 monthly payment. Uh, but that's another thing. Sorry for jumping into that. No, uh, all I, good. I'm good here. Kaido, I want to hear from you on this. Yeah, I, I think w- one thing I thought a lot about is, I think go back, it goes back to Evan's point, which is, is somewhat similar to the current system with token voting, but I think with one major issue. So uh, the main major issue is, let's say if a protocol becomes big enough in the future, which we hope it will, that this becomes sort of like a public good kind of thing or like an infrastructure le- level stuff. That means if someone has less money than another person, that you know the person who has less money will never be able to voice his opinion if they like if they're they're on the other the two sides of the same coin, and that's not the case in in the traditional world per se. So if you because right now um, I think we're trying to use the the governance model for companies to use on these like really infrastructure layer protocols such as you know Curve. Compound Ave, right? If you want to digitize the entire world, right? Those are very fundamental um, stuff. So I think that's the the worry I have on that, and you can see that sort of playing out in the in the current landscape, where you know just three projects can get together and kind of dictate a large chunk of like you know base layer projects in, uh, emission going where and you know achieving their own agenda in some way. I think when this is a kind of model, I think when it's going good, it's going great, right? Uh, but but if some disagreement happens or someone um, even maybe not like trying to do malicious things, just like their 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 idea may not be you know really well thought of, then it has you can have like really catastrophic failure mode introduced to the entire system. Yeah, so that's kind of my thinking on token these uh, token gated. I, I actually on um, voting, I think probably the most thing I, I like the most is probably some sort of token voting. And also you have the optimistic approval. Uh, this shout out to Dan's Orca design, like the different pods and with uh, with veto power across. I think those are, it's a lot more interesting where it goes back to Ivan's point, right? You don't let your token voters uh, vote on a project like every two days on proposal. That's just like not possible. You do it in an optimistic way that you, let it pass, but if there's some major disagreement, you can people can still shut it down. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, and thanks for the shill. Um, I'll disclose, <laughs> Kaido's not an investor in Orca, but we appreciate that. Um, Will, curious because I don't think developer DAO, you guys don't have a token. You have NFTs, so like, curious yeah, we're working how on it. Oh. How you're managing that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're we are working on a uh, non financial governance token, and so that's going to be coming out in the the next kind of sixty days. And um, <laughs> one of the things you know we always think about is um, you know like how how separating incentive from uh, governing power and fi- uh, financial compensation. Like, are there are we developing protocols that generate revenues that we can then distribute out to contributors um, in in addition to um, governing power inside of the DAO. Is that something we can do? How can we closer sync the activity that's happening to, um, the incentive reward? So like retroactive, um, uh, incentives are safe, but they, um, basically it's like, Hey, come and work with us. You don't have a boss. And, uh, we, uh, have a plan to have 5,000 people vote to reward you in, 60 to 180 days isn't like the best pitch to get a ton of activity. And so how do we shorten that time period and better sync activity together? Um, And so those are things that we're thinking about. To your original question, I'm optimistic that um, we're going to continue to find ways to um, use things like the the pods and um, smaller groups of De- like decentralized s- smaller groups that build up into the larger DAO, whether it's sub DAOs or whatever, whatever we want to call it. Pods. Um, <laughs> pods. Yes. We'll use bots. And so that is like, that's something that I am, um, like I said, super optimistic about it because I think the reality is um, the, the other side of that coin is a world in where, um, you know, we get centralized meta governance happening that, Instead of a centralized Web2 company controlling um, power, it, it's in the hands of, of um, pretty massive um, kind of meta governance uh, plays. And so, um, and 
the, the last thing I'll say there is I always ask myself and try to ask other people too, is, um, you know, like, what are my assumptions here as far as um, the, the questions I'm asking? So like, is that a bad thing on the financial protocols? And um, is total, total um, tokens used in, in govern governance proposals? Is that really the metric we should be shooting for? Um, and so those are just questions mm -hmm. that I hope other people continue to ask. Um, and I'll, I'll of, yeah. probably jump in and have the spicy uh, thing. It's, I really like BAYC's uh, governance roadmap. I think you start mm -hmm. with NFT, you have more NFT, and then you have a token. I think thinking from like a community dilution standpoint, branding, and also like just retaining talent, I think that's something even more than, you know, um, uh, more than, you know, just NFT projects could use. Yeah, I, uh, if you tell me six months ago, I would be liking BAYC's governance. Yeah. Uh, Damn, you know, really. I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> I think that's um, more food for thought for everybody as well. Must have nice. been a fat head drop, sir. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, we're, we're getting close on time. So just to recap, you know, we've talked about what is governance, incentive design, DAO tooling, token voting, um, Kaido shilling, board apes to us. And yeah, maybe we just end with like, with everyone, like what's, what are you excited about with your specific kind of protocol or DAO or projects you're working on? Maybe start with Ivan. Um, finally raising the limits on the accounts and the TVO. Uh, that's probably how those went into voting now. Thanks delegates for pushing quorum in like two hours or something. So it, it is working. Uh, well, yes. we'll see how it works in a few weeks, but yeah. Uh, and then after that, probably looking forward to ETH Global actually in Amsterdam. So very much looking forward to it. Uh, and after that, V2. So essentially a lot of things to do, a lot of products to build and hope uh, you guys, if you use them, you won't be liquidated wrecked too soon. Sweet. Will? Yeah, i um, excited for our governance token launch and pretty aggressively um, trying new things and sharing that with the community and, and kind of seeing what happens. Nice. Kaido. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm interested in uh, decentralized science, science funding, so like Gitcoin. I think their governance model, how it relates into the entire ethos and how do we spread that ethos and incorporate into different other projects I think would be really, really interesting. Very sweet. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do the honors and uh, ask Dan. Um, what about you, Dan? What are you looking forward to? <laughs> oh, thanks. I'm going to shill. Um, so Orca protocols in private beta, and we are hoping to get to a public beta in the next two to three months. So basically opening up access to more DAOs, get them onboarded, um, and get the pods going. Sub DAOs, working groups. Amazing. Appreciate it. I think uh by the way, this was a this was an amazing discussion. I think the uh the one thing I'm I'm just sort of as an observer, just hearing all of you say is what I'm kind of understanding is that looks like we're in a position where we're basically saying that we want to just experiment with the same primitives that exist with the abstractions rather, um, which is proxy voting, delegation, doing things at scale and kind of hierarchy that sort of comes with it. But I think there's like a better solution with the technologies we have now uh, to be able to do that faster or just uh, more efficiently or measure that uh, in a smaller feedback loop. So um, I don't know what the answers are. I think all of us are figuring this out in real time, but at least there's a lot of hope and excitement that that what I look forward to. So we'll get to see a version of all these things that we already understand just done more efficiently or, or openly. So I'm excited for that and really appreciate all of you uh, making time to be part of this panel. Great. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank see you. Up. Thanks Dan. Thank you for organizing yeah. this. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. And with that, we are ready for our last talk for the summit. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jonathan, Larry and Connor on stage to talk about all the fun stuff about doing compliance and legal working with DAOs. Um, <laughs> and for this chat, Connor will be the one moderating and uh, I yeah. already have a great face, so uh, I'll let you talk about all the, the fun things. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's, I don't know about illegal and compliance being the, the end of the day situation because it's a, it's a, it can be very um, mind-bending and painful, but we'll try to make it as exciting uh, and engaging as possible to like send people off into their weekend. So I'm Connor Spellacy. Um, I was formerly a lawyer and then got into crypto, helping crypto companies raise and do a number of things. About four and a half years ago, I started in the space. 
then realized, oh, we need some advocacy. So co-founded the Blockchain Association. So over the last kind of four years, I've been working primarily on the advocacy side, but then also uh, working directly with DAO teams and run an organization called the DAO Research Collective, um, which is funded by the Ethereum Foundation and others, uh, which helps procure and then open source research related to uh, foundational DAO issues like legals and governance and a number of different things. And then we also have with us, we're very fortunate to have both Larry and Jonathan. So we're going to get the operator perspective here today from Larry, who has has had to spend a ton of time with lawyers and is a pro himself now, essentially a lawyer, but then also Jonathan, who is literally a lawyer. So maybe actually uh, Larry and then Jonathan, if you guys give a little intro, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm the only non-lawyer on this panel. So everything I say should be should be discarded for sure when it comes to legal. Um, I'm the co-founder of Reverie. You know, what we are is, is governance activists. So we, we work with DAOs very closely and help them scale, help them grow and help them operationalize a little bit in a in a little bit more of a mature way than than they are used to. And then prior to that, me and my co-founder were both uh, venture investors. I was at Digital Currency Group, he was at Blockchain Capital. Cool. Uh, so I'm, I'm Jonathan. If I, uh, I am the founder of Iterative Law. Um, so I, unlike Connor, I'm still a lawyer and I still practice. And um, I, I am also probably mostly and almost completely degen as well. But I tend to work with a lot of uh, crypto and blockchain companies in uh, helping them uh, figure out how to uh, get to the market, uh, get their projects running, and also doing things in a compliant manner. And uh, um, part of fun and working in this space is um, well, how just how quickly things change and how quickly you have to sort of think through issues and try to do things, um, you know, in the um, the best way you can, given the knowledge in front of you. So uh, constantly changing uh, landscape and uh, lots of fun. Thanks, guys. Um, and so, of course, yeah, nothing here is legal advice. Um, but starting uh, starting with Jonathan and then moving to Larry, I, I would love to hear this is going to be a broad question. But what are the most pressing issues, legal issues facing DAOs today? Um, I, I'd say from my perspective, um, the, the the pressing legal issue is just figure out how exactly uh, is a DAO sort of put together? How does it work from a legal perspective? And how does it interact with the meat space, right? Like, because everyone talks about using governance tokens and, and providing community the opportunity to vote and to uh, provide direction for, say, the network or the project. But how does that exactly connect with, um, you know, the real world? How does it work with, say, banking? How does it work with um, uh, hiring people and, and, and delegating authority to people? And so I think those are kind of questions that um, we're all sort of struggling with. We're trying to take existing frameworks and trying to mash them in. We've got some innovations around trying to build new frameworks, but sometimes the new frameworks just look like old frameworks. And so I think there's a lot of a lot that still needs to be done here and a lot that we can sort of think through. Larry, what do you think? I, I, I totally agree with what Jonathan has said. I guess I'll try to cover this from a non-lawyer operator perspective, but you know, at, at a really high level, right? A lot of the structure a lot of teams use is, is they put their whole treasury into this smart contract, which is controlled by the circulating supply. And that smart contract has no legal wrapper around it. And so whenever you want to do stuff with the real world, with the meat space, like maybe, you know, sign a contract or hire someone or maybe acquire a company, you're not really able to do that because there is no legal entity to interface with against the DAO. And, um, and that really is a huge challenge. Now, I think a lot of teams, technical teams, when they start the DAO stuff, they're like, we'll figure this out later. And then when the later comes, that's when, um, that's when you know, shit hits the fan and things need to get operationalized and challenges and problems really begin. Um, the other, the other um, weird um, thorny problem I would say is, is actually, it's not sexy at all, but it's tax related. It's just figuring out how to um, manage the treasury in a way where you're clear on what taxes you're due or, or not have to, don't have to pay. And uh, a lot of teams do have a lot of trouble with that. Yeah, those are interesting ones. Um, and it's it, what I'm finding too is with, with teams that I chat with. Um, and I did a bit of a, I did a survey related to an event that we ran last summer with, with Bankless and with the help of Youth Global uh, and Stanford and others uh, where Larry spoke at too. But um, the idea of the event was focused around like the the issues that DAOs face on the governance and, and legal side and, and treasury management side as well. But um, afterwards did a survey, figured out that um, what hit DAOs, I mean, legal was one of the biggest issues for DAOs generally, but 
almost um, the the things that were not yet being addressed properly or at all in the ecosystem were the things that were like the real plumbing, the, the real background infrastructure, the structuring that is often the most painful stuff to do. So Larry, you talked about taxes and I know that's a huge sticking point for a lot of DAOs and DAO treasuries, like when they're thinking about how they distribute funding, is that a taxable event? And if it's a taxable event, is there a tax regulator to which they have to provide funding? And if they don't, are they going to be dinged for that, right? Or are they going to kind of gain the ire of the regulators in a way that they really don't want to? Um, I'd, I'd go, you know, even a step back on that is, um, you know, the mm -hmm. token sales, right? Um, so if, if uh, the tokens are not securities and they're not sort of capital uh, products, then they're commodities, they're, they're, they're products that should you be paying sales tax on that? Is there income tax involved? It depends on where, where you're selling it to from and where who you're selling it to. And sometimes you don't even know who you're selling it to because mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's all on chain, you know, uh, it can be anonymous. And so um, some of the, the challenges around that is um, how, how, do you, how do you sort of structure or figure out a way to, you know, put the DAO into connected to the real world in a way that you can kind of confidently say, yep, we, we don't have pay tax in this situation or we pay taxes in these situations only. Uh, so those are those are some of the, the, the challenges. Yeah. And in thinking about what some jurisdictions are doing to address that, you know, we're seeing some particularly smaller jurisdictions that are quickly providing clarification, right? Like the bigger the bigger EUs and uh, the US are, are they're doing their own thing, um, but they're not going to be providing the very detailed regulations that, for instance, maybe Cayman or other jurisdictions can provide. So with this question, I'd love to, to get Larry's thoughts first and then Jonathan. But Larry, from your perspective as an operator. Um, what are some of those DAO, the most common DAO legal structures that you're, you're seeing founders tend towards and why do you think they're being favored? Um, the, the first thing I will say is for any founders listening is, um, you know, the, the in vogue um, structure that's recommended by lawyers, like it's, it's um, often uh, what's in vogue today may not be in vogue five years from now, 10 years from now. You saw a lot of... Um, uh, various structures used in, in 2017, 2016 that today lawyers would tell you do not use, run away from it like, um, like the enemy. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good to generally um, have a state of mind, uh, I, I approach, you know, the structure with a state of mind that, hey, this may change. This is just the thing that's invoked today. And um, it may or may not stick around in the long term, because frankly, no one really knows. And a lot of it is um, an emergent thing based on you know, what the policymakers and the jurisdiction where you're structured uh, think about the structure. Um, you know, but with that said, you know, the, most of, the, most of the, um, the structures we see, it's, it's you know, a lot of offshore entities. And I think a lot of people get scared whenever they hear offshore, like they have you know, Panama Papers, that sort of stuff um, in their head. But you know, a lot of it is, is um, you know, it's, it's stuff like Cayman Entities, BVI, there's a new, um, uh, Guernsey Trust that we can chat about later that people are, are using, but there's um, generally tax friendly jurisdictions that people use that have really good counsel. So whenever you want to structure stuff, you know, you can rely on very competent lawyers to, to help you do that. And I'm sure Jonathan can speak way more about it than I can, but those are the entity types that we see most, most often. Yeah, uh, that, 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 that's basically, um, yeah, sort of the, the, the flavors that um, are, are pretty popular these days. So yeah, Cayman, BVI, um, uh, it's funny you mentioned Panama Papers. I think um, you know Panama Foundations are also kind of looked at as an, a, a quick and um, a sort of way of, of, of sort of getting a structure in place. Um, and I, I think they all have interesting benefits. So, so the big one that you're talking about, the tax efficiencies or the fact that they're in, in zero tax jurisdictions, is actually helpful with that tax question because if you don't have to pay capital gains tax or income tax on it or sales tax on anything you do, then you're good, right? Like you, assuming that you can actually. You know, kind of say you are actually operating in that jurisdiction and everything. Um, but I think some of the benefits around, or I think maybe the reason why some people also gravitate towards particular structures like this is, um, is uh, you know, are, are they sort of conceptually, philosophically aligned with what you think a DAO should be doing? Um, so, like for example, like some of these foundations uh, uh, structures, you don't have to have owners, right? You just have you can have a board directors or, or, or counselors, and then you've got you know you, so who sort of function as maybe your multi stakeholders or um, as as the people in the real world that operate for your entity. But because it does, it's not owned by anybody. You don't have shareholders, you don't have members. It feels like it's owned by the community. It's 
not like you know some other company or person actually controls the DAO. It is the the, the, the DAO um, token holders, and so I think there's a philosophical bent towards some of these structures as well. Um, but uh, that that is sort of where where we look. I think the, the main one is you know um, trying to solve some of those tax issues, and then providing some kind of entity or or structure that can actually interact, like enter into contracts and and, and do things like that. That's super helpful. Um, and Larry, I know that you've done a lot of innovative work recently on the Guernsey trust structure, which has become popular. And um, DYDX did something very impressive there. Mark Boyron, their general counsel, wrote a great piece on it. I highly recommend people read. And I know Tara did, made some big moves there too. So, I mean, you don't have to get too into the weeds and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but would love to hear um, you know, what you've seen from that structure and what might draw founders into using it. Yeah. So the first thing I say is, is um, we'll say is, is um, you know, credit really goes to Mark here. It really, that structure is his brainchild and he can, um, he can talk more about it than I can. But what I, what I can share about it in particular is, you know, what we try to do is we tried to create a grants program for DYDX and are, and are you know, uh, running a grants program for DYDX. And we had a problem, which is how do we pay contributors that are in the United States? And then how do we sell DYDX? without paying capital gains, or if we have to pay capital gains, uh, not making token holders pay capital gains, right? Because there's a lot of um, lack of clarity on who pays taxes when it comes to DAOs. And over time, we'll figure this out. But today, it's a little bit of a murky area. And so those were the, the business problems we were dealing with. And, uh, and Mark created an awesome, helped uh, us create an awesome stru uh, structure, which is Guernsey, uh, in Guernsey, and it's a Guernsey Trust. And, uh, and for those who are listening, who've never heard of Guernsey, it's not New Jersey, it's not a state, it's a, it's a, it's a small island, uh, and it's like one of those financial islands, but in Europe, so if you've heard of Cayman, BVI, you know, it's the equivalent um, for, for, I guess, Europeans, that's how I think of it. And, um, and it was very quick to set up. Um, it had, um, you know, very favorable um, tax treatment for the DYDX that's contributed to it. Um, you know, in terms of just the, the corporate policies, it's, pretty well understood. The trust structure is not this new thing that no one's ever operated before. And so when you actually hire counsel to help you form it and operate it, people are very clear on what you have to do to run that structure. And so that's why we went with it. And um, no, it's still very new. We've not been operating it for over a month yet. And so we'll see how it sticks in the long term. But so far, it's been an excellent structure for, um, you know, very quickly spinning up um, uh, you know, tax friendly entities for DAOs to use. Right. No, I think, I think it's such a, it's nice for you to demystify that. And for Mark to have written that piece, because a lot of founders come into this and just end up having to have calls with five different counsel from five different, like kind of obscure jurisdictions. And it's hard to wrap your mind around what it is you're actually doing. So kudos to, to you guys and to Mark, of course, for writing that piece. And hopefully we see more from the community like it that can demystify and save people time. Um, Jonathan, flipping to you, uh, this is going to be one that I'm sure a lot of founders are interested in, but what are the biggest legal mistakes that DAO founders typically make? Like when someone comes to you as a client, what mistakes have they already made before they show up to start talking to you? Um, I, I think one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen before is um, going off and doing your uh, basically doing your token offering before you even thought about the structure. So you're, you know, oh, I can, I can get, the, I'll, I'll take that smart contract. I'll, I'll rework it and I'll raise some funds and, uh, and away we go. Uh, and then coming back afterwards and saying, okay, so we, we did this, we have a community now. Um, so now we, now what do we do? Um, because the, the cat's out of the bag in that sense is that you, you, it's very difficult for you to, um, you know, sort of hive the risk off of, um, you know, doing token issuances, doing, entering into contracts and things like that when, uh, you don't have a, a legal structure to begin with. And so, you know, maybe taking a step further back from that is not talking to um, to, to a lawyer first. And um, I mean, frankly, most lawyers are more than happy to have an initial conversation just to understand what you're doing and, you know, see if there's a way to, 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 to help you. Like they're not going to charge you up front. Uh, I, I, I definitely don't. I, I love talking to projects to see what they're doing. And if it works out and it, it sounds like it's, um, you know, they're sort of in the right place to start working together, then great. And if not, you know, you know, then that that's okay. Like they, they, maybe they still got some billing to do, but I think it's always important to just, particularly in this space, when there's so many, um, you know, complications, the biggest complication is that the technology is global in nature, but the laws are jurisdictional. So you might think you're doing things 
perfectly fine in one country, but you might get in trouble in another country. Mm -hmm. uh, and you might be in a gray area in a third country. And so just being thoughtful about that, or at least talking to someone who, who understands that there, there's, you know, you should think about some of these things. And the other part would probably be the tax part as well that we talked about, not realizing that, you know, what you've done may have actually caused you to, um, you know, create a massive tax bill for yourself or for your, your token holders. Yeah, that's, no, that's great. And I, I think to talking to making sure that when you talk to that lawyer, that is a crypto native lawyer who has experience in the space and is not just some corporate lawyer who's like, yeah, I'll set up a C Corp, we'll do the thing and, and you'll be good. Because I've chatted with a bunch of founders and experienced with organizations that I worked for previously that have been told to set up the wrong structure. And then it's an insanely complicated process to go from maybe a US structure to an offshore structure. And it also just it doesn't make a lot of sense. So the I think the the people we're going to have almost this um, founders who are doing their second crypto company, I think, who are going to do it better because they're going to appreciate that. Oh, I need to do a lot up front to save myself an insane headache later on that might actually jeopardize my own company. But it's worth it because I've now laid the infrastructure that allows for me to make a great case, potentially from a tax perspective, liability perspective, you know, a number of different different places. I'd also add, Connor, like, you know, the difference between, say, you know, three years ago and now, like, there, there are a lot more lawyers that actually sort of really understand the space, and maybe not all of them focus on it, you know, 100% of the time, but um, it, it's, you should definitely, to your point, do talk to somebody that has an understanding of, of you know, crypto blockchain and just some of the issues around it, and, and get that initial conversation, right? It's uh, just, just so you don't accidentally walk into something that you, you can't dig yourself out of. Yes, yeah, just, been... just to add on to that, it's, um, I think a lot of founders, they, um, they, they almost treat law as, you know, some, some rocket science that they can't wrap their head around and they'll, you know, whatever advice they'll take, they get from a lawyer, they'll just take it without actually questioning it and understanding it uh, at a really high level. And I think it's really important, if, even if you're a technical founder and if you have no background in law, you actually have to understand at a high level what advice you're getting. You don't have to understand all the uh, the legal documents uh, point by point, but having a, a high level mental model of what you are doing, um, what risks you are taking versus not taking is very important. And I feel like a lot of founders don't, don't get as involved in the legal as they probably should. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And actually, uh, I would highly recommend to founders that they're looking for a lawyer to listen to a podcast that Larry and Derek Sue, his partner did, um, I Pledge Allegiance, where they were talking to both Jake Travinsky and Mark Boyren, who are two of the leading lawyers in crypto about almost in part what to think about when you're finding a crypto lawyer. And it'll save you a lot of time and a lot of money. So I would, I'm would, i shilling that here on Larry's behalf. He won't do it himself, but I listened to the pod. It's incredible. Um, taking Now taking a slightly like different direction and thinking about the interaction of law and some of the other issues we're dealing with in, uh, you know, with DAOs. Larry, um, would love to get your thoughts on how you're seeing founders and operators in DAOs think about the interaction between issues related to things like governance and treasury management, um, and then how they connect that with law or the extent to which they think about law when they're implementing decisions about those other features or, you know, uh, critical components of DAOs. I feel like if you try to do any sort of legal work in 2020 or 2021, um, you would get like a lot of uh, dirty looks. Like people would say, wait, we're doing this DAO thing. Why would you, you know, loop lawyers in, right? That's the enemy, right? Or any sort of like off-chain stuff, that's the enemy. And, you know, at this point, I think people are realizing that, hey, these are things that we actually have to do if we want to grow these DAOs and scale these organizations in very big ways. Um, you know, at a really high level, um, the biggest change I would say between, um, you know, maybe late 2020s, early 2021 and today is um, the entity types are pretty clear. People know which entities to use, which outside counsel to engage in, right? So who are the actual people who I can turn to to help me set this stuff up? In the past, to, to Jonathan's point, there were not really that many lawyers who were comfortable to take on the risk or of, of a token project that say today, there's just many, many more people who know what they're doing and are providing pretty good advice. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, as a result, what you have is many different types of uh, legal structures uh, that essentially hold tokens that were previously held in no legal structure are now held in some sort of legal structure. And that really allows DAOs to do all this sort of stuff, things and, and, and 
um, activities they wanted to do previously that they couldn't do. And so it opens up a world of opportunity that you could just couldn't do in the past. And how do you think about like, given that there's like so much nascent development, I mean, it, I think it's, you're totally, totally right. It's great that you have more lawyers who are having a better sense and are more comfortable, but given all of the, the changes that are happening so quickly on the governance and the treasury management side, like how can you keep your lawyer or how do you see teams try to keep lawyers engaged such that they can also opine on the decisions being made about things that are like quite technical or, or, um, you know, also very dynamic while also thinking about the legal side, like, is that, is that happening very much? Um, I would say it's, it's really difficult to, um, be, be a lawyer on the cutting edge, because not only do you have to follow policy developments in the world, but you also have to follow the technology and like fundamental improvements in the technology. And for any one person to be able to follow these two very emergent industries is difficult. And so, you know, every now and then you do find people who are able to, you know, play in, in, in both categories, but it, it is hard. And I think the technology is always going to move faster than the law. And so you're always going to, if you're doing something that's pretty wonky on the technology side, you're always going to have some degree of legal risk and, and some uncertainty. And I think that is just the cost of doing business as a founder operating in a, in a very emergent space. And um, taking a little bit of a different direction here, this is something that I personally become interested in um, and would love your guys' thoughts on. And it's, it's consistent with, I mean, there are buckets of things that I think that those who found and, and run DAOs now know they need to think about, like they need to think about legal structure, for instance, that is pretty commonly known, right? But there are many other things like voting policies, for instance, which are new to Dow founders. Maybe that's something you think about if you're involved with public companies and you, you know, you understand how that works or you work a lot from whatever, but there are more nuanced um, parts of law that founders are starting to have a better appreciate, appreciation for, or um, maybe should have a better appreciation for. So have you guys seen anything um, as it relates to DAOs starting to engage with like conflicts policies as it relates to voting or the way that they delegate certain votes or the way that their investors delegate certain votes? I mean, I, I can sort of speak a little bit about this. Um, I, I think uh, they're, they're, I've seen projects that I've been working with um, starting to think about some of these things and um, I think it's probably because uh, you learn from uh, you learn from your own mistakes, but you also learn from other people's mistakes. And so, seeing how, say, some DAOs have um, and, and the the uh, their sort of uh, management structure may have blown up because of um, interpersonal issues and you know um, uh, personal um, uh, uh, interests over the the interests of the collective and so on. So, uh, which is funny because as much as as um, uh, you sort of want to ignore. Um, you know the corporate space, and in some ways, um, uh, you know the the, the the genesis of um, of this industry was a, a complete, you know, really a, a, a an aversion to the the, the centralized, um, you know, corporate world and the way things are operated. There's a there's actually a lot you can learn from corporate governance and and you know conflict um, management and things are encoded in corporate law. Frankly, right? If you you know you should not be voting on something that you have a personal interest in if you are part of a uh, of a management committee or a subcommittee, right? Like that, that's actually entrenched in, in corporate law. And so um, th those are like small things that if we sort of take some of the, the learnings from that, or um, uh, at least some of the, the, the reasonings behind it, I think it'd be very interesting to kind of pull that back and, and put it back into uh, the, the DAO sort of governance structures. And it's not to say we can't innovate on top of that, but let's learn from what we have and, and uh, continue to build on that. Great. No, I think that's a that's a really fair answer. I mean, I think that's generally something that 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 we need to think through more critically is how can we look to existing precedents? Like we can help build a new revolutionary system, but there are some truisms about the human condition and the way that people are incentivized that have not changed over the last five hundred years. And we can look to research on that front to help inform us as to how we can build the right systems now. Yeah, and and, and you know what what's really cool, I, actually, I think, is that the, the systems that we can build actually can provide more interaction, more direct um, control and and uh, power to people who are participating in DAOs, right? Um, you know, so like the voting mechanisms, like like snapshot, is really cool. I would love to actually see that used in 
uh, in the corporate world because uh, because mm-hmm. in the corporate world shareholder turnout for votes is like 30 percent whereas using something um, you know as sophisticated as you know it, it's really just technology to allow people more access um, so we can kind of take it from both sides and, and, and actually be better for it my, my sense for, this, for stuff like this while we're on that topic of you know conflicts mm-hmm. of interest and more more accountability is you know generally um, you know when, when there's a boom and bust cycle, it's during the busts that a lot of the, the policy and, and the internal controls get created, right? You look at pretty much any industry, that's just how stuff works. But what you can do when you're in a boom period is just self-policing and self-regulation. And I'd say like some DAOs have this culture where they're, they're not going to you know, sue you if you have any sort of conflict of interest, but there's this policy and it's almost like a, a cultural principle that, hey, by default, we will disclose conflicts. We don't have any responsibility to do so, but it's important to us. And so that's the honor code we're going to follow. And, and that I think gets you 95% of the way there. The bad apples will still, you know, break the, the rules. But for the most part, I think stuff like that, while we're still in, in a period of really high growth, um, uh, self-accountability and enforcement is, is really important. And it does get a lot of DAOs to, um, to a good place pretty quickly. Yeah, I think it, I think it's a, I mean it was a really good point. It's also hard. To, it's very hard in this space given that so many people work for so many projects. It, it presents a new um, challenge that hasn't usually existed in in the corporate world, or at least not to the same extent, right? Right. And, well, um, but, but what's funny is that we we have policies now about um, you know board members being on too many public boards because of that issue. You know, you're you're a director on five or six or more companies. You cannot possibly be able to focus on all of them at once. And so again. These are things that we can take from the corporate world and kind of go back and say, do we need to have a formal policy for this? Or should we just sort of put something in place for a particular desk saying, look, you know, we want you to be involved, but if you're involved in too many projects, maybe you should step back from one or two of them, right? Totally. And then when you have like, you, you, you know, I've been in a bunch of board meetings that have these formal policies, but the board members are asleep at the wheel, right? And so, <laughs> you know, just because you have rules doesn't mean people actually follow them. Absolutely. You're right. That, that's absolutely true. And last question, um, really appreciate the time, guys, um, on the Friday afternoon. Last question here, which could be legal or probably is not legal related, but what are some of the things you're most excited about in the DAO ecosystem? Um, I, I think I alluded a little bit to this, but I, 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 it's, it's the technology, right? The ability to, um, to provide more access and more control to, uh, to token holders. So, um, you know, right now, I think most DAOs still have, um, you know, uh, multi-sig wallets that you need, uh, you know, multi-sig holders to actually go and interact with the wallet once a snapshot's been taken, you know, the, the, the proposal's been passed. would love to see, you know, some of that, the, the more direct interactions with them. Um, uh, with, with, with the systems, right? Where you don't need that, that personal intermediary. Um, it'd be really cool to see it, you know, to, to see, I think as a token holder, to see that my vote and passing of a proposal directly uh, results in an action. Yeah, I, I would just add that um, unlike traditional companies, I think you can have a really effective DAO with very, very few people. They're very lean organizations um, if structured that way. And for you as one individual or five individuals to be able to move the needle on, on the product in such a way that you actually see that the stuff I did you know, contributed to this level of growth, that's a really fulfilling feeling that a lot of people have who work for DAOs and having more of that is very exciting to me. And I know people who work for DAOs feel very similarly. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time, guys. And thanks to Eve Global for putting this on. So I'll pass it back over to you, Kardik. I was going to say, what else to make sure, uh, Connor, you get a chance to answer the same question. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts too. What am I most excited for in the DAO ecosystem? Um, what I'm most excited for, honestly, is the opportunity to collectively work on improving the DAO ecosystem. Like, I think that crypto enables us to do much more cooperation and collaboration as it relates to building out the industry in a way that we would never see in like traditional private companies. Obviously the tooling it enables, but also the spirit and the mission of the people who are working in crypto um, such that I'm excited to see this community scale at a faster rate than any other sort of similar organizational structure we've ever seen. This is awesome. I think this is a pretty good way to summarize kind of what 500 people are going to be hacking on in the next 48 hours. So, uh, We'll, uh, we'll keep you posted on everything that comes out. Well, Tom, awesome. Larry, Connor, thank you so much for uh, that amazing talk and uh, looking forward to having you join us again in the future. Sounds great. Good luck in the hack, everyone. Peace. Yeah, take care. Thanks, everyone. Good luck. 
All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our summit. And I want to thank everybody who uh, watched everything, engaged with us, asked amazing questions, and honestly is uh, still participating in the hackathon and working on interesting projects. We're going to still resume a handful of workshops right after this. But in the meantime, I want to wish everybody happy hacking. And uh, we'll all see you on the Discord. And we'll see you all here again on the live stream this Sunday to uh, showcase all the amazing projects that came out of it in about 48 hours. So with that, uh, enjoy some lo-fi beats and we'll see you all soon. Take care, everybody.